There are 249 town meeting members, 125 constitutes a quorum. The constable informs me that 125 are present. The November 6th, 2017 special town meeting will now come to order. The clerk will read the call and return of the meeting. Hampshire, to one of the constables of the town of Amherst in said county greetings. In the name of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you are hereby directed to notify the registered voters of the town of Amherst of the special town meeting to be held in the auditorium of the Amherst Pelham Regional Middle School in said Amherst at 7 o'clock on Monday, the 6th day of November 2017, when the following articles will be acted upon by town meeting members. You are hereby directed to serve this call by posting attested copies thereof at the usual places. Hereof fail not and make return of this warrant with your doings thereon at the time and place of said meeting. Given under our hands the 16th day of October 2017, Douglas Wesley Slaughter, Constance E. Kruger, Andrew J. Steinberg, Elisa B. Brewer, James J. Wald, Select Board. October 16th, 2017, in obedience to the within warrant, I have this day as directed posted true and attested copies thereof at the designated places. Chun Yu Zhu, Constable, Town of Amherst. Thank you very much. Are there any newly elected town meeting members who were not sworn in last spring? I see at least one hand, so, so please rise. And do you swear that you will faithfully and impartially perform the duties of town meeting member? Please answer, I do. Thank you and congratulations. A quick note. You all know better than that. Um, quick note on finance committee appointments. Sharon Pavanelli has been appointed to the empty seat that was vacated by Steve Braun last spring. Mary Lou Tileman and Bernie Kubiak have been reappointed to new three-year terms. I would like to thank, without applause, past, current, and new finance committee members for their service to the town. It's a tradition to remember former town meeting members who have passed away since the last town meeting. There is no comprehensive list of former members, so if I've forgotten someone, please let me know and I will remember them in a subsequent session. Since last, we met last spring, we have lost Isaac Ben Ezra, Louis Greenbaum, Ruth Hook, Rick Keller, and Rhonda Nachbar. Please rise if you are able and let's have a moment of silence to remember our friends, neighbors, and public servants. Thank you. Just a quick review of the schedule. We're scheduled to come back on Wednesday, November 8th. Who knows, maybe we'll finish up that night. Maybe we'll finish up tonight, you never know. Um, then we have the auditorium booked for Thursday the 9th, Monday the 13th, Wednesday the 15th, Thursday the 16th, Monday the 20th, and Monday, December 4th. I'll explain on Wednesday how we're going to deal with the question of when we meet next after Wednesday, if it comes to that. Some important reminders for everybody. The seats on the floor of the auditorium may be occupied only by town meeting members, except for the front row, which may be used by members of the press and by members of town committees and town staff participating in the presentation or discussion of articles. Such persons must wear non-voter stickers, which are available at the check-in tables. The seats in the front row of the section in front of me can also be used by those who are on deck. If the next article is one where you will be presenting or expect to be questioned on, please come forward and sit in one of those seats before the vote on the current article. The seats in front of me on the right are occupied by the select board members, the town manager, the assistant town manager, the co-finance directors, the assistant to the town manager, and IT staff. The finance committee is seated to my left. Spectators and town residents who are not town meeting members may be seated in the bleachers to the rear of the auditorium. New information for town meeting members can be found on the back table. Old information can be found on the back table to my right back there. New information, if there is any, would be on the back table to my left. 
Amherst Media provides gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of our proceedings on Public Access Channel 17. I'd like to thank their staff and volunteers. Videos of town meeting sessions are replayed frequently and can also be viewed on the Amherst Media website. If you wish to speak, you must raise a hand and be recognized. You must hold up a card to indicate your position. Green indicates yes, red indicates no, and a white card indicates that you wish to speak without advocacy or you wish to ask a question. When you are called on, please first state your name and precinct. If you forget, I will interrupt and ask you to do so. If you need more than three minutes or more than five when speaking to your motion, you must request additional time before speaking and town meeting will vote on your request. If you're speaking from the floor, please speak into a microphone that will be provided once you are recognized. This will allow the viewers outside the auditorium to hear you. The microphone will be on when it is handed to you. Please hold it close to your mouth when you speak. Non-members who wish to speak should stand at the rear of the right-hand aisle, which is the aisle directly in front of me. Um, any registered voter of the town of Amherst who is recognized by the moderator may speak without special permission. Others may speak with the permission of a majority. Assisted listening devices are available for town meeting members at the soundboard in the back of the auditorium. If you're making an amendment to a motion, the amendment must be presented in writing with four copies submitted to the town clerk, the moderator, town manager and staff, and the chair of the finance committee or whichever board is seated to my left. Procedural motions, such as a motion to refer or a motion to dismiss, do not need to be presented in writing. If you make any motion from the floor, it must be the first thing you do after you have been recognized and have identified yourself. You cannot speak first and then make a motion. If you haven't already done so, please check your cell phone, make sure it is silenced or off. I will be reasonably strict on time limits and I will always try to call on people who have not yet spoken. If at any point in time you are confused about the proceedings, it is appropriate to call a point of order and ask for a clarification. Also, it is always okay to phone me, send me an email, or see me prior to town meeting if you need an explanation of any kind. I will not call on members by name, even if I know perfectly well who you are. I will stop speakers when your time is up and ask you to finish your current sentence. I will attempt to be consistent with all speakers and equally fair or unfair to all, but I will be inclined to give some deference to board and committee members, petitioners, and town employees. We're now going to have a quick test of our electronic voting devices. So hang on while I get that script in front of me. All votes taken at town meeting will initially be by voice vote. After a voice vote, if the moderator or any member so requests, requests we will take an electronic vote. When you checked in, you received an electronic voting device. We will now run a test vote to make sure that everyone understands how it works. First, make sure your device is turned on. When your device is on, you will see your device number on the device LED display. If you see a totally blank screen, press and immediately release the power button, which is in the bottom right-hand corner, and a display will appear on the screen. Is there anybody who does not see a display on their screen? Okay, we're good. Somebody who doesn't see a display? Stand up or yell or wave to me. All set now? If you come to the front here, we'll, we have another device for you, or Sean's bringing it back there. Oh, I'm sorry. So while we're waiting for that, it's a good idea for everyone, as soon as you get to your device, turn it on, and then if it's not working, you don't have to wait for me, you can come right up and deal with it. Okay, I'm going to go on talking while he's working on those two devices. Um, so the only functional buttons are one, two, and three. One means yes, two means no, three means abstain. You will never need to press any other buttons on the device. Other buttons will have no effect on your vote. When we're ready to come to an electronic vote, the subject of the vote and a countdown timer will appear on the large screen in front of the auditorium. When the timer on the screen in the front of the auditorium begins to count down, you may enter your vote by pressing one for yes, two for no, or three for abstain. You can change your vote while the timer is counting down, again, by just pressing one or two or three. It is not necessary to press any other buttons. 
Your last vote entered while the timer is counting down will be displayed on your LED display. This is the vote that will be counted when the timer reaches zero. There may be a lag time of up to five seconds from when you press the button to when your vote is displayed. If you do not vote until after the timer reaches zero, your vote will not be counted. If you change your vote after the timer reaches zero, your change will not be recorded and your previous vote will stand. The middle line on your LED display will always reflect the most recent valid vote that was counted. A vote to abstain will be recorded, but it will not count towards the result. For a majority vote, the greater of the yes and no votes prevails. For a two-thirds vote to pass, the yes votes must be at least two-thirds of the sum of all yes and no votes. Abstentions are not counted in either equation. You may only vote with the device that has been assigned to you. If your friend or loved one goes to the bathroom, they cannot give you their device and you cannot vote with two devices, only your device. When you leave town meeting, please power off your device and return it. To power off your device at the end of the evening, you press and hold the power button until the LED display is clear. Please drop off your device on the same side of the room where you picked it up. If you do not return your device, you will get a call from the town clerk's office the next morning requesting that you immediately bring your device into the town clerk's office. We will have a 30 second window to enter our votes. Um, are those two devices all squared away? Everyone set? Okay, we are now gonna have a test vote. So if you would put it up on the screen. And the window is open. Is there anybody who does not see their vote displayed on their device? Okay, the window is about to close. And yes, 121, no, 55, abstain, 5. And it, yes, is correct. There was indeed a bylaw against using cocaine while driving your taxi. Just to know. Um, okay, what's going to happen next is we're going to hear four procedural motions. There are four articles that the sponsors wish to move to be held on Wednesday. So you're gonna hear four different somewhat odd times in their motions, but the gist of it is the order in which we hear these motions, that's the order we're gonna hear these four articles on Wednesday. So I first call on Chris Riddle to make a motion for Article 13. And wait for a microphone, please. And wave your head up and down. Good, there we go. Chris Riddle, Precinct 2, I move that we hear Article 13 on Wednesday, November 8th at 7.05. Motion made and seconded. Do you wish to speak to your motion? Microphone back, please. Microphone, microphone, microphone. <laughs> Sorry, we tricked you. Um, this is mostly me. I'm personally, I think that it would be possible that it would show up on Thursday. And if we were still doing this on Thursday, uh, I cannot uh, be here on Thursday for the, another commitment, so I'm asking that we do this on Wednesday at a date certain. Is there further discussion before we come to a vote? I see no hands. We're now going to have a vote. Requires majority to hear Article 13 on Wednesday, November 8th at 7.05. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. Um, it carries. We will hear Article 13 at 7.05. Um, now I call on Nancy Higgins to make a motion for Article 12. Ms. Higgins is right in the front corner there. Here comes your microphone. And you can stay seated if it's difficult to stand. I move to hear Article Hold it really close to your mouth. I move. Aaron, can you check if it's on? Try again. I move to hear Article 12 on Wednesday, November 8th at 7.15. Second. There's a second. Um, you may now speak to your motion if you wish. One of our speakers is only available on Wednesday. Thank you. Is there discussion before we come to a vote? I see no hands. We will now vote on moving to hear Article 12 at 7.15 on Wednesday, November 8th. All those in favor, please up. 
Yeah, and there's a great reason for it, and you have till the end of the evening to figure it out and then tell me what you think. Um, all those in favor of hearing Article 12 on Wednesday, November 8th at 7.15, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No one's opposed. Passes unanimously. I now call on Andra Rose to make a motion for Article 16. I move that we hear Article 16 on Wednesday, November 8th at 7.20. Motion is made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. Um, it, we, well, now they're out of order, but the reason is the same reason as for Article 13, that Chris Riddle um, cannot be present on Thursday, and um, the select board and the petitioners agree that we'd like to have 16 and 15 on the same day. Thank you. Is there further discussion? I see no hands. All those in favor of moving Article 16 to Wednesday, November 8th at 7.20, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Um, it passes. Article 16 will be on Wednesday, November 8th at 7.20. I now call on Mr. Riddle again for a motion for Article 15. Chris Riddle, Precinct 2. I move that we hear Article 15 on Wednesday, November 8th at 7.25. Motion made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. Identical to the, my um, needs uh, with regard to Article 13. Is there further discussion? Are we ready to come to a vote? See no hands. We're voting on whether or not to move Article 15 to Wednesday, November 8th at 725. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. The ayes have it unanimously. So the order when we get to Wednesday will be 13, then 12, then 16, then 15. And that's it for the preamble. And we are ready to go forward with Article 1. And I call on Mr. Slaughter from the Select Board to make a motion. I move in terms of the article. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. As is, the, as is the common practice at uh, both special and annual town meetings, we uh, authorize Article 1 to allow for boards and committees to uh, deliver reports to us, and we appreciate getting information from them. Thank you. Um, and the Finance Committee is in no position. This requires a majority. Before we come to a vote, I should just tell you that there are two reports that we're going to be hearing from. First, the Dog Park Task Force is going to be issuing a report, and then the Select Board and the Economic Development Director will be issuing a report on all of the five marijuana-related articles. And they're not going to give that report until we reach Article 3. So after this passes, we're going to hear the Dog Park Task Force, then we proceed with Article 2, and then we're going to hear the marijuana report. Is there further discussion before we come to a vote? I see no hands. We're now voting a majority vote on approving Article 1 to hear reports. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say no. The ayes have it unanimously. I now call on Nina Allen from the Dog Park Task Force. Oh, there's a podium right there. Amherst is home to over 2,000 dogs and the humans that love them. We are striving to make Amherst an even more dog-friendly community by creating a place where dogs and their families can come together to socialize and play. The Amherst Dog Park Task Force was established in the spring of 2017. Our vision is to build a fenced-in park in Amherst that is free to all visitors and is supported and maintained by volunteers in the community. The task force has nine members appointed by the town manager as well as three non-voting liaison members. Dave Zomack, the Director of Conservation and Development, Carol Hepburn, the Animal Welfare Officer, and Jim Wald representing the select board. The task force first met in June of 2017 and has had four full meetings as well as several subcommittee meetings. Members of the task force have been working in five separate areas, site location, design, funding, rules and regulations, and sustainability. The first goal is locating a site for the park. The task force is working closely with town staff to identify possible locations. 
Our preference is to use donated land or land already owned by the town, but we are also looking at the possibility of purchasing land. The current plan of the task force is to submit a request to the Community Preservation Act Committee in December requesting funds to purchase land for the dog park. We plan to supplement the CPA funds with a grant from the Stanton Foundation of Massachusetts, which supports the development of enclosed dog parks in Massachusetts cities and towns. The Stanton Foundation grant will pay nearly the full cost of building the park. Task force meetings are posted and the public is welcome to attend. In addition, we will be reaching out to the Amherst community looking for support and volunteers to assist in the maintenance of the park once it's built. We will be looking for your support in the 2018 annual meeting to vote in favor of a CPA allocation. The members of the task force believe that a dog park will be a benefit to dogs, their families, and the community at large. We're grateful for the strong support we're receiving from the town manager and the town staff. We hope that town meeting will support our efforts as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to article two. And I call on Ms. Ratner to make the motion. I move in terms of the article. Second. Motion is made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. This article requests town meeting to move some free cash, $1,301,633 to the stabilization fund. Free cash is money that remains at the end of the fiscal year because town departments did not spend all money appropriated that year or because actual revenues were more than budgeted revenues for the year. This money goes into a free cash reserve account. As of July 1 this year, there was $5,162,239 in free cash certified by the state. The town's other reserve account, the Stabilization Fund, currently has $7,595,350 in it. This fund receives a higher interest rate than free cash as it's bundled with other funds. Appropriation to both funds requires a simple majority vote of town meeting. A simple majority vote of town meeting is required to withdraw funds from free cash, while a two-thirds majority vote of town meeting is required to withdraw funds from the stabilization fund. The town's financial management policies and objectives state that reserves should be from 5 to 15 percent of the general fund operating budget. These policies also state that if free cash exceeds 5 percent of the operating budget, the excess may be transferred to the stabilization fund. Currently, reserves are at 16.5% of the general fund operating budget. So the Finance Committee is recommending by a vote of 6 to 0, with one absent, that the free cash above the 5% level, or $1,301,633, be transferred to the Stabilization Fund. The total in the Stabilization Fund would then be $8,896,983 after this transfer. The total amount of reserves would still be $12,757,589 as seen in the chart. Thank you. Um, I call on Mr. Slaughter from the select board. The select board. The select board voted unanimously to recommend this article to you for the same reasons that Ms. Radner just uh, identified. Thank you. This requires a majority vote for passage. Is there discussion before we come to a vote? And yes, right in the front row there with a white card. Yes, John Fox. Um, I wonder if somebody I'm sorry, could- your precinct, please? Uh, precinct 10. Um, I wonder if somebody could tell us the portion of this 1,301,000 that came from not having to fund programs to the level that we had voted on and the extent to which they were, it's additional resources from revenues came in. I'm asking that because, you know, we, we made some hard decisions last, last time about what we could and couldn't fund. And if a major part of this is from not having to spend money on projects that we had funded, it would be important to know what they were and 
for us to have a sense of what we missed, that we could, we could have used this 1,300,000 for some very important projects. So I'm not opposed to putting it in free cash, but I think we need some better explanation. Anybody at the front table have an explanation offer? Hang on here, point of order. Yes, um, wait for the microphone, please, and identify yourself. Jim Bursat, Precinct 6. Is it possible to just get the lights in the front to be horizontal? We, they're always directed right at this side, that overhead light especially. Thank you. Um, our IT person is on the case, but no promises. Meanwhile, can, does anybody want to respond to the question? Mr. Bachelman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, make sure that microphone's working. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, we don't know the exact uh, numbers. Uh, we can get that for you tomorrow. Um, we made the report to the um, select board and to the finance committee, but we just don't happen to have the numbers in front of us right now. Further discussion before we come to a vote on Article 2? I see no hands. We will come to a vote. This requires a majority. Okay, all those in favor of the motion, which was in terms of the article, can you get the motion up on the screen? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. no. The ayes have it. And before we get to Article 3, we're now going to hear a two-part report on the marijuana articles. But before that, I just want to let you know that for some unknown technical reason, ACTV is not currently transmitting town meeting. Um, they're aware of it, and I've been told it can't be fixed at this time. So in case you hear of that, we're aware that they're having some sort of technical difficulty. I now call on select board Ms. Kruger first. Good evening. I'm going to give a brief report explaining why we're here before you with five articles related to the local regulation of recreational marijuana, or what is sometimes referred to as non-medical or adult use marijuana. So I'm sure by now you know that on November 8, 2016, Massachusetts voters passed the state law legalizing recreational marijuana. Medical marijuana had already been legalized, and this town meeting had already adopt, has already adopted a zoning bylaw amendment regulating medical establishments. Many people felt that the initial bill passed needed improvement. To this end, Governor Baker signed a bill delaying implementation by six months. During that time, the state legislature made several changes, and July 28, 2017, Governor Baker signed the general court's revised law on the subject, an act to ensure safe access to marijuana, or the act, adopted as Chapter 55 of the Acts of 2017. So, this compromise bill helped clarify some of the aspects of the law that we in Amherst were concerned with. However, the newly appointed Cannabis Control Commission has until March 15, 2018 to promulgate regulations. These regulations, we hope, will give much more detailed information about how a municipality can regulate recreational marijuana. Until the time that we can review and respond to these regulations, we believe that the package before you tonight is the best and most responsible way for Amherst to prepare for the legal sale and use of recreational marijuana. 54% of Massachusetts voters approved the ballot initiative statewide last November. In Amherst, 74% of the voters approved the initiative. The team of elected officials and staff working together to prepare Amherst for retail sales is well aware of the health and safety challenges legalization for non-medical purposes brings with it. 
We have not taken our responsibility lightly. Regardless of how you feel or how you may have voted on legalizing marijuana, the fact is it is now legal. And given our position as a regional center and the host to a university and two colleges, we anticipate Amherst will be impacted by legalization. Tonight, you will hear a suite of articles designed to best address these impacts. We realize that once the Cannabis Control Commission promulgates regulations, adjustments may meet need to be made and we will be back before this body, we may need to be back before this body for additional amendments or bylaws. This is a work in progress, but we believe these actions will best prepare Amherst for regulating retail establishments, collecting revenue, and dealing with public consumption of marijuana products. So now, Jeff Kravitz, Amherst Economic Development Director, he was chosen by the town manager to lead the town's efforts in preparing us for implementation of legalization, is going to um, give a more detailed presentation about um, why we're trying to pass these, the particular bylaws that are before you tonight. And in fact, one of them we may not want to pass. Hang in there and, and uh, follow us along. Um, so um, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Kravitz, who's going to give a little more detail and an overview of the timeline and what we're going to do. And then we're going to have three general bylaws and two zoning bylaws. So um, that's, that's the five. And I know you have information in your packet about that. So I could turn it over. Thank you. And I just want to note, I'm not going to be putting a timer on Mr. Kravitz. This is in lieu of me calling on him for three minutes for each of the five articles. And he assures me his total time is going to be less than 15 minutes. And watch your step by the podium there and don't trip on that cable, please. Good evening. Jeff Kravitz, Economic Development Director. Um, I'm going to keep this as brief as possible, um, but I will be sticking around in case there are specific questions on individual Warren articles. Uh, the first thing is I want to talk a little bit quickly about the internal working group. We've done the best we can to educate ourselves. We've gone to dozens of and participated in dozens of hearings and public meetings, um, forums, workshops, listening sessions. And our approach with the five Warren articles before you this evening is to provide you with as much choice as possible um, and ways to implement the will of the voters in a thoughtful and deliberate manner. So I'm going to talk to you about why we're doing the articles tonight and the timing, bring everyone up to speed on where we are with medical marijuana, because that impacts recreational marijuana, and then briefly go over the five Warren articles. So here's a timeline dating back to September, and there are three dates that I want to highlight. The first is that the Cannabis Control Commission regulations are due on March 15th of next year. They're going to begin accepting applications for recreational marijuana retail licenses on April 1st. However, we're not having another town meeting until April 23rd. Now this is critical because the only thing that the law says is that when the Cannabis Control Commission gets an application, they're gonna evaluate it to see if it's in compliance with zoning at the time the application was made. So anybody who puts in an application prior to town meeting, um, it would be based on, on our current zoning. This is a bit of a dated map um, about statewide. The places in yellow are actively dispensing medical marijuana dispensaries. There's also another one in Great Barrington that recently opened, and there are a total of 15 operating. All the purple ones are the ones that have achieved accreditation status. There are about 100 of them. Um, 
it's important to note that because they, the ones with accreditation status get priority review um, and if there are no cannabis control regulations by July 1st, 2018, they can automatically start to sell recreationally. Um, and then regionally, there are 16 proposed in the Pioneer Valley, one currently operating in Northampton, and um, Amherst has four. The only community with more is Holyoke with five. Moving on to Amherst, as I mentioned, there are four here. Um, None are currently in operation. It's important to know this because, again, they're given priority review and municipalities are prohibited from preventing a medical dispensary from converting to recreational establishment, according to the law. So all four of these, here's the current status, all four have received provisional certificates of registration from the Department of Public Health. Um, two of them also have special permits from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Neither of them has signed host community agreements, which is also a requirement of the law. One has a host community agreement, but no special permit. So that's currently where everything stands. And now I'm going to talk about the warrant articles. Article 3 is a local option retail marijuana excise tax. This is the same idea as the local option meals and rooms taxes that Amherst has already adopted. Essentially, the town would receive 3% of all revenue generated by the sale of recreational marijuana by establishments in, operating in Amherst. Um, Article 4 is a limitation on the number of recreational marijuana retail establishments. The law sets out sort of two paths those who, for municipalities that voted for the ballot question and those that did not vote for it. As Ms. Kruger said, we did vote for it. Um, so any limitation below either 20% of the off-premises alcohol licenses issued or less than the number of medical marijuana dispensaries um, with accreditation status must be approved by a vote of the voters. So that would be um, lower than four would need to go through uh, a ballot, a local ballot question. And I also want to note that town council and the attorney general's office recommended including this limitation both as a general bylaw and in the zoning bylaw, so that's why you'll see it in both places. Article five is a prohibition on public consumption of marijuana or THC. Currently, the Amherst Board of Health regulations are broadly defined and prohibit the smoking of marijuana in public places and workplaces. This would extend that prohibition to other forms of consumption um, in public places. Article six is the zoning bylaw. Um, it's recreational marijuana retailer. It creates a new use classification called marijuana uses, moves um, medical uses to that classification creates a new category for recreational marijuana retailers um, and then amends the version of medical marijuana standards and conditions and uses that as a basis for all marijuana uses. The zones are the same zones that were approved for medical marijuana dispensaries except uh, no recreational marijuana retail establishments would be proposed in, or allowed in the office park zone. And a planning board representative is gonna go into a lot more detail on, on some of the particulars of that article. And finally, article seven would prohibit, it's a temporary moratorium through January 1st, 20, well, technically through December 31st, 2018, and it would prohibit new recreational marijuana retailers from applying for a license until that date. Um, and one quick note on that, if town meeting passes both articles six and seven, the way the moratorium is written, it would um, take precedence over the zoning, so there would be a moratorium even if both pass. And with that, hopefully I was short enough, and uh, I'll stick around for questions because I'm happy to answer any of those. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hear a point of order. Wait for a microphone, please. Jeff, you can have a seat. Meg Gage, yeah. Precinct 1. I apologize that I didn't ask this when you first raised it. The ACTV is not broadcasting, but are they taping? 
And if they're not I taping... Hear, I see somebody nodding yes. Great, just because otherwise we could get somebody's phone going or something. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we now move on to Article 3, and I call on Ms. Brewer to make a motion. I believe the wording, no, I believe you're moving that motion. I think, I believe our town council recommended it. I have a note on it. Yeah. Right, so. I move that the town accept Mass General Law Chapter 64N, Section 3A, as recently amended by Section 13 of Chapter 55 of the Acts of 2017, and impose a sales tax upon the tr sale or transfer of marijuana or marijuana products by a marijuana retailer operating within the town to anyone other than a marijuana establishment at the rate of 3% of the total sales price received by the re marijuana retailer as a consideration for the sale of marijuana or marijuana or marijuana products. Motion's been made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. Mr. Moderator, given that I'm going to provide both uh, rationale for the article and the select board's position, may I just combine the eight minutes? Yes, you may. Thank you. And for those of you wondering what was taking so long up here, we were trying to remember what was different from the warrant. And as many of you have probably spotted, if you look at your warrant in the second line where it said orig third word was originating, that word's just been removed. So I could have moved in terms of except removing that word, but that's how we did it. Um, let me just interrupt for a sec. For those running the clock, um, we're giving Ms. Brewer eight minutes because it's five for speaking to her motion plus three for the select board position, just so you know. Thanks. Okay. You may continue. Thank you. The select board recommended Article 3 by a vote of 5 to 0 on October 23rd, 2017. We hope the town meeting's aware that prior to our specific select board deliberations on these marijuana articles three through seven at the select board meeting of October 23rd, broadcast live and available on channel 17 and on your computers, that we have had marijuana updates at most select board meetings for the past year under member reports and also specifically provided a community conversation item at the select board meeting of September 18th which included a slide presentation by Mr. Kravitz and the opportunity for public input, although attendance was relatively light. We also hope you found the double-sided FAQ fact sheet uh, provided in the town meeting mailing informative and that you visited the marijuana webpage, which is just amherstma.gov, marijuana, on the town website. And that you may have also viewed yet another presentation by Mr. Kravitz in addition to tonight at the televised TMCC League of Women Voters warrant review on October 24th. We have not been provided any questions by those who facilitated the TMCC warrant discussions and have only heard back reports from a few individuals, so we're not really sure how much information you want to hear tonight, although I'm confident you don't want me to speak for eight minutes, so I'll try not to do that. Mr. Kravitz gave an excellent overview. The reason for Article 3 is quite straightforward, as he indicated. The select board doesn't know how much education of our ever-changing population on the safe and legal use of recreational marijuana is gonna cost us, and having a revenue stream will help. That's why the select board advocated with the state for an increase, as this has been playing out over the past many months, for two to three, from 2% 2 to 3% to provide that 3% local option to each of our 351 municipalities. We believe the maximum allowed, 3%, is right for Amherst. 
the users of the recreational products will actually pay the tax through increased recreational product prices, just as with restaurants and hotels, as Mr. Kravitz mentioned earlier, and as we were early adopters of as well. If we don't have this revenue stream, we are going to have to cover our entire educational efforts with first, funds from host community agreements, and then general taxation. Of course, the downside of doing this is that recreational use product point, price point will reflect that local tax, just as restaurant and hotel prices reflect our extra local option excise tax. The question has arisen is does this apply to medical? It does not. We cannot, no matter what we try and do here in Amherst Town Meeting, we cannot tax medical. There are two specific provisions in the law that prevent us from doing that. Mass General Law Chapter 64N, Section 4, that refers specifically to not applying to the sale of marijuana or marijuana <laughs> products by a medical marijuana treatment center or a registered personal caregiver to a qualifying patient or personal caregiver pursuant to Chapter 369 of the Acts of 2012 nor, of course, to any unlawful sale, because how would you collect taxes on an unlawful sale? Also, it's in Session Law 55, which you'll hear referenced again tonight, probably because Session Law 55 is the one that finally got passed this summer. And it specifically added medical use of marijuana to the act, and it said, marijuana sold pursuant to this chapter shall not be taxed under any of the chapters that tax marijuana. Then the question arises as to why isn't the host community agreement in the law enough? Why isn't that enough money? Well, we, we don't know how much money that's going to be at this point. We don't know how much we're going to be allowed to put in the host community agreement. It's not yet clear from regulations as to whether or not it will be only police enforcement. Are we saying it's a public safety issue? Um, does that have a cost assigned to it? Does it include effective educational materials that we're constantly distributing and doing outreach to new residents? college students who live on campuses, tenants, we don't yet know what it'll yield. What it does say in the law is that we can't require payment that is not directly proportional and reasonably related to the costs imposed upon the city or town by the operation. We don't know where education is going to fit into that. We don't have any regulations yet from the state. So we think the excise tax is what's going to help us there. In terms of when this takes effect, the law was written to provide basically a default, which is that it would take effect in a city or town on the first day of the calendar quarter following 30 days after its acceptance. That's the one we decided to go with unless we had wanted a later date. We put it into effect now. Obviously, nobody's selling yet, but we will be ready when they are. We hope you support this. Thank you. Pardon me. Is that a point of order? Okay, wait for the microphone, please. Jennifer Page, Precinct 8. I think there just may be a typo in the motion that Ms. Brewer read. The last section of the, the last portion of the last sentence should maybe should be sale of marijuana or marijuana edibles or marijuana products, which is similar to the way it's written in the original article. Otherwise, it looks redundant. Yes, marijuana or marijuana edibles. So I'm going to take that as a friendly amendment to the motion. Does that make sense? Ah, uh, so what town council recommended, it's the extra marijuana. We wanted to read total sales price received by the marijuana retailer as a consideration for the sale of marijuana or marijuana products, period. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we now hear from Mr. Kubiak of the Finance Committee. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, um, and thanks to Mr. Kravitz and Ms. Brewer for their uh, uh, excellent presentations. Uh, all of you have had a chance to look at the Finance Committee report, and you'll find our uh, recommendation on page four of that report and the rationale for that. Uh, this, um, uh, the Finance Com Committee, by a vote of 6-0 with one absent, recommends the passage of this article. Thank you. This article requires a majority vote for passage. Are there further questions before we come to a vote? Um, yes, I see a white card way in the back there. Hallenberg, Precinct 1. I would like to discuss, first of all, medical marijuana was passed in 2012, and people except for veterans 
were charged $200 to get a marijuana card, which amounts to an illegal tax, in my opinion. Um, excuse um, me, can I interrupt for a second? Um, I don't know if you understand, but the discussion here has nothing to do with medical marijuana. No, it's about okay. a tax on recreational marijuana. I understand, I okay, understand. Okay, good, you may continue. Uh, let, so we're not taxing medical marijuana users. Nonetheless, a lot of people who might have become medical marijuana users were afraid to get on that list, and indeed, the federal government has requested that list from Massachusetts. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, on this Article 3, um, is there a similar tax on alcohol sales or pharmaceuticals or tobacco? OK, you may be seated. Um, further discussion? Um, yes, second row right in the center there. Although, I called on you this time, but I didn't see any color card. Thank you. But that's the last time I'm going to do it. I'm going to be really careful and not call on people who are just showing me a hand with no card in it. Gordon, Gordon Freed, Precinct 6. Um, I'm going on poor information, but what I think I know, or don't know, is that if someone makes money off of the sale of marijuana, something about they can't put it into banks. And so how do we know how much money they are making off of it? That's one question. And the other question is, will this 3% be put into a separate fund? Or will it just go into our regular um, uh, general fund? Mr. Bachman? Um, in terms of the, first, the second part of your question, uh, funds like this would go into the general fund of the town and it'd be considered a revenue just like any other revenue. And the, and the medical companies are, are there, the uh, recreational companies are supposed to report to the town their sales. Thank you. Further discussion? Um, on the aisle right there with the white card. Um, wait for the microphone, please. Pat DeAngelis, Precinct 6. Um, I'm still trying to get an answer to the part of the question that you had, which is, um, are liquor stores charged an excise tax? You said rooms and food, but you didn't say liquor, alcohol. And I'm trying to figure out whether we charge an excise tax for them for police, uh, extra police work or anything like that, or education. And if we don't, why are we going to do it for marijuana? Ms. Brewer. We don't have that option. Oh. <laughs> we don't have that option. So we are allowed to increase the tax that applies to meals and so that includes things like ready to eat meals from the grocery store and meals from restaurants whether take in or take out and then um eat in or take out and then we we can also do that with hotels but we are not authorized by the state to add a tax onto what you might buy at a package store bottle of wine etc i'm sure we would do it if we had the option but we haven't <laughs> I hear a point of order. Because uh, Identify yourself, please. John Cool, Precinct 2. Because we're trying to cover the bases here, I'd just like to be an obnoxious English major and say that I would like the last bit of Article 3 to read products no. containing I'm marijuana. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's not a point of order. Um, you can raise your hand and maybe you'll be called on. You can't, it's not a point of order that you want the article or motion to be phrased differently. It's, you have to be recognized to talk about that. That I think it is wrong. Um, yes, back corner right there.
Um, Mr. O'Connor, why don't you identify yourself and make your motion, but then I'm going to have a little pause afterwards while I okay, determine sure. if it's valid um, or not. Vince O'Connor, uh, Precinct 1. And I move to um, remove from Article 3 um, uh, the word recreational wherever it appears. Okay. Is there a second? second. Okay. First of all, I, you have to understand you can't remove anything from the article. Your motion from, needs from, to be remove the, the word recreational from the motion. From the motion, if, that, if that's okay. And, yeah. okay. and before you speak to it, let me look at this and determine if I think it's valid. So, Mr. O'Connor, the motion does not have the word recreational in it. Unless I'm missing something. Does anybody else see the word recreational in the motion? No, in the motion. We're looking at the motion. Okay, there, the word recreational does not appear in the motion. It's the motion that we're discussing and voting on, so this is not applicable. Okay. Point of order. I hear a point of order. Paige Wilder, Precinct 3. I just want to clarify, originally when, I mean 10, I don't know why I said 3, Article 3. Um, when the motion was presented, we were told that the only change was to eliminate um, originating. So now we have different, more changes. Can someone speak to exactly what the changes are? Okay, it's not more changes, but we did overlook that change. Um, but let me explain a little bit. An article is what the town and town meeting is warned about ahead of time. This is what's going to be discussed. The motion is what's actually discussed and voted on. It's perfectly OK to remove a word, add a word, so long as the moderator determines it's in scope. In this particular case, I suspect if you look at the law that's being cited in both the article and the motion, probably in there the word recreational shows up. And it's not necessary or critical to have it in the motion, is my best guess. At any rate, the important thing is the motion before us is what we're discussing and what we care about. The significant change in the motion from the article was changing that word of originating within the town to saying op a retailer operating in the town. And that's because town council felt it wasn't clear what we were taxing. And we're the, the idea is to tax retailers who are selling marijuana in the town. So that's the significant change that was made to the motion. So there is no reference to recreational in the motion, and therefore your motion is not applicable. So may I, may I? no, you may not. I may call on you, or I may not, but you should have a seat. Um, I, I just point out, um, I did listen to the description, but I, cannot, I can't read things from back there. So okay. that um, description was omitted. Okay. It, Okay. Made it difficult for me to understand what was going on. Okay, but hopefully you do now, correct? Good. And it's, it's tough, I know. I can't read from back there either. When I was a town meeting member, I always sat in the front because it's the only place I could see anything. Um, <laughs> further discussion? I see a hand on the aisle right here, again with a white card. Uh, Hilda Greenbaum, Precinct 1, and I have two questions. The first one is there was an article in the New York Times today which said that, mentioned the proportionality between the cost of uh, legal for sale retail marijuana was many, many times higher than the illegal stuff that you could buy in California. And so my question is, given this, this is a largely cash business, if what the previous speaker said about not being able to bank the money. How do we know how much money is actually being spent on legal marijuana in this town? How, would, how are we going to audit the proceeds from these stores? Mr. Kravitz or Mr. Bachman, if you care to try and respond, you may. Mr. Kravitz. Mr. 
So the way that the tax is going to work is there's also a state sales tax and a state excise tax that are imposed. All taxes are going to be remitted to the state, so they're ultimately responsible for ensuring that um, the that their books are kept clean, and then they will remit the 3% if, if we pass this article to the town. So it's going to be the state's responsibility to check on that. Thank you. Um, way in the back corner there. Morian Adams, Precinct 10. Uh, I don't now see, uh, with the word recreational taken out, how the distinction between medical and recreational is maintained. Could somebody please explain that to me? Mr. Kravitz, can you help us out there? Uh, Ms. Brewer. So I acknowledge that it's strange but it doesn't matter. We could say medical in it and it wouldn't apply because it's illegal for us to have the tax on medical. So it's only what we tend to use the term recreational for, although you also see the term retail as opposed to medical. So the fact that it doesn't specify which one doesn't matter because there's only one kind of marijuana sale that it can apply to. It can apply to illegal sales for your accounting reason, and it can't apply to medical sales based on the two laws that I cited. It cannot, no matter what we try and do, it will not. And so that just leaves what we refer to as recreational or retail. Thank you. Um, yes, I see a white card halfway back there. John Gould, Precinct 2. In the last line of the motion, does marijuana products mean products that contain or products that are used in conjunction with marijuana? Mr. Kravitz. Products that contain. Thank you. Further discussion before we come to a vote? Um, yes, in the corner there. Vince O'Connor, Precinct 1. So um, one of the reasons I, I made the motion, and I apologize for not having realized that, that it was removed from this particular article, but there is no indication on the other articles that refer to recreational marijuana that the, that, that word recreational is going to be removed. And my understanding is that the new law, which those of some people who have smartphones can actually look up chapter 94G of the Massachusetts General Laws, um, actually does not use the word recreational. And, and therefore, that word is not defined. Um, I don't see it defined uh, um, in... Uh, in any of these articles, and the word obviously is it's problematic if the new, if the new state law that authorizes all this activity does not use that word, and we are using that word in our both our 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 general bylaws and our zoning bylaw. I I just wonder, aren't we creating a problem? that I think, I'm sort of neutral on the tax thing. I think it's probably a reasonable amount uh, as opposed to maybe the state tax, which I think is a little excessive. But I am concerned that we may be using a word not defined in the state law and, um, and I have no idea whether it's been proposed to be defined. Uh, certainly I don't see a definition in the general bylaws and, um, and or in the zoning bylaw. And I, I wonder what the response of those who participated in the, in the process of bringing these articles forth have to say about that. Okay. It's technically more a question for Article 4 than 3, but I'll let you respond now if you want to, Mr. Kravitz. Sure. I think the idea was that we wanted to make a distinction between medical use and non-medical use. Chapter 94G 
The title of the entire chapter is Regulation of the Use and Distribution of Marijuana Not Medically Prescribed. And I think we used it as another way of saying marijuana not medically prescribed to distinguish it from medically prescribed marijuana and to avoid confusion that if we just said the word marijuana, people might think it's both medical and non-medical. Ms. Kruger. If I could just add, because you asked what uh, was discussed in the uh, working group that we had, and we did have a discussion about using that word because it has certain implications that we, we might not uh, want to um, associate with uh, what we were trying to regulate. But it was, it was decided that it was a common understanding that what we were talking about was recreational, called recreational marijuana, and that to start calling it um, non-medical or you know, age eligible, and we, we, we looked at a bunch of things, we rejected that at the end because we just thought it, the common understanding would be clearer if we just said recreational marijuana. Um, you might have a different opinion about that. Further discussion before I come to a vote? Um, yes, I see a hand in the back over there. Hi, Caroline Murray, Precinct 4. Do you have information on what the tax rates are in the neighboring towns, Holyoke and Northampton in particular? Um, if no one has that information, um, not to say so. No, nobody, just to interject, I don't think anybody has bylaws in place yet, do they? This is, this is new to everybody. Ms. Brewer, did you have anything to say or no? Um, further discussion? I see no hands. I think we're ready to come to a vote. This is a majority vote. The motion is before you on the bottom half of the screen. All those in favor of the motion for Article 3, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. no. Moderator, here's a majority. We will have an electronic vote. So, <laughs> so when the vote is on the screen and the timer begins, you can enter in your vote. And we are voting on whether or not to accept the motion under Article 3. And the window is open, you may vote. And I didn't, I, I didn't receive, press your vote a second time if you don't see a yes or a no or an abstain. Hang on, we are just on hold while IT figures out what's going on. Your test vote worked correctly? You broke it. <laughs> what will probably, oh, hang on. Okay, can she still vote right now, Sean? Okay, so why don't you put in your vote, and then as soon as he gets back to the desk here, we'll show you the results. We have 175 yes, seven no, four abstain. The motion has passed. Let me just write that down, 175, seven, four. And we now move on to Article 4. And I call on Ms. Brewer to make a motion. Mm -hmm. 
I move in terms of the article. Second. Motion made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. Thank you. I'm very sorry for the confusion on the last one. There was a lot of last minute typing associated with that. This one's quite straightforward. It's in terms of the article. The select board recommended article four by a vote of five zero on October 23rd. We have every reason to believe, given current information provided in the law and in the absence of the regulations that aren't due to be promulgated until March 15th, that all four of the medical marijuana dispensaries in process in Amherst will eventually be allowed to either change to both a medical and recreational retail model or perhaps just a retail model without further local control beyond the development of a host community agreement. That means we are working from the assumption that we are going to have four what we've been terming recreational, non-medical, marijuana retail establishments without taking any further action and with no further say as to where they are. Some people may wonder if we should just let the market decide the number we end up with beyond those four. It is certainly worth noting that no other type of business in Amherst is limited in our town general bylaws or in our zoning bylaws by the actual number of establishments in terms of a simple number versus placing zoning restrictions or health regulations. Yet, some people are also leery of simply letting it happen, given the fact that this is a newly legal industry. Some people say recreational, non-medical marijuana use should be treated similarly to tobacco and alcohol, both of which do have local limits. For example, the Amherst Board of Health, an appointed, not elected body, not subject to town meeting approval, chooses how many tobacco sales permits to issue, so how many tobacco outlets exist in Amherst, and has in fact also required them to sell to 21 and over, not 18, like you still see lots of places, and has regulations about things like selling individual cigarettes. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts, in its infinite wisdom, has provided all of our municipalities with a federal census population-based quota system for alcohol licenses roughly in segments of 1,000 or 5,000 population. So for example, an all alcohol on-premises license, so that's a restaurant or a bar. We've issued 35 of the 40 that we're allowed. We're allowed 40. We have wine and malt on-premise licenses. Think of Amherst Cinema, the Amherst Golf Club, and six restaurants that chose to go that direction. We're allowed eight, we've issued all of those. And we also have off-premises licenses. You heard us speaking briefly of package stores at one point for all alcohol and places like Atkins, Cushman, and the Amherst Center store for just wine and malt, again, based on per 5,000 of population. We've issued eight package store licenses, and three of the eight wine and malt licenses were allowed by quota in terms of off-premises. Yet despite these strict alcohol quotas, the Commonwealth has not limited the possible number of recreational marijuana retail establishments. The Commonwealth did try and do that with medical at some point, but then that got changed. Recreational marijuana legalization advocates and the Commonwealth determined for reasons that have truly never been clear to any of us who have been working on this for the past year, that the number of recreational marijuana retail establishments could by local option be limited to 20% of the alcohol off-premises licenses that we have currently issued. So, redirecting you back to the preamble for Article 4 and the warrant. Mass General Law Chapter 94G does not require a vote of the voters to approve any limitation on the number of recreational marijuana establishments that is at or above the number of medical marijuana treatment centers registered to operate, doesn't matter if they're open or not, or equal to or greater than 20% of the licenses issued for the retail sale of alcohol beverages not to be drunk on the premises. If town meeting members want the number to be less than four recreational marijuana retail establishments, then town meeting would need to pass an amendment to this motion and vote a motion for some number between zero and three. But then there would be no effect until we have a town-wide election posing that number somewhere between zero and three that was selected by town meeting and put that on a ballot question. Mr. Kravitz does have handy for us the logistics of election scheduling if that's what you wanna know about later. So without a local town-wide ballot question with no one, which no one in our community has called for, the only restriction town meeting itself can effectively apply is some number greater than four. We therefore chose that's number eight in article four based largely on these factors. I'm gonna run out of time and I'd really be surprised if I had eight minutes to begin with, but I'll try.
Finish it up. I don't think I did. We believe many Amherst voters voted for question four not because they wanted the streets of Amherst lined with recreational marijuana retail establishments, but because of all the criminal and social justice factors involved with the long history of disproportionate marijuana criminalization imposed on people who are not white. And if we chose the number four, then all four of those recreational marijuana retail establishments were going to be owned by white men. We already know that. We know who they are. If we choose the number six, and some people thought that was a little too low, given the number above, the moderator wouldn't have allowed us to increase the number. He will not allow you to increase the number tonight above eight to remain within the scope of the article. So the number eight seemed to give town meeting some breathing room. If you could sum it up quickly. Yeah. Thanks. So I didn't have eight minutes. <laughs> anyway. You will hear more about the number eight when we're talking about zoning. So this does go with planning article six. And you will find that if this number changes as town meeting votes on article four, then the planning board will move article six to reflect that change. Thank you. The finance committee has no position and article four requires a majority vote. Is there discussion before we come to a vote? Yes, right here in the aisle. Um, Janet McGowan, Precinct 8. I have a question um, about lessons learned, because we're not the first state to have um, recreational marijuana or medical marijuana. And I've seen you know, parts of LA that have just medical facilities that are pretty sleazy. Colorado has had an experience with recreational marijuana and also has college towns. And you know, Washington State, there's some cities, you know, like Amsterdam, that have kind of gone up and back with marijuana. I'm just wondering, like, what are the lessons learned? What are the pitfalls? What what could be something you'd like to prevent? Is there, you know, just what what did the committee learn? You know, about youth use of marijuana effects on businesses. You know, having a whole street with things, just anything like that. If somebody in front cares to answer, they can raise their hand. Ms. Kruger. Um, I don't think this is really the time or place to get into that. I can assure you that we've been, we've, um, we've done that research. Mr. Kravitz has done much of it. I've been, uh, one of the memorable ones I went to was an um, audio presentation with a judge and a dean of students um, from Boulder, Colorado. So I think we've collected that and tried to incorporate that knowledge into um, our thinking about what we could regulate locally, but to, to really get into a conversation about all the things we've learned from other communities, I, I, just, um, I, I just, I don't see how we could do it right now. Um, yes, way over in the left corner there. Um, microphone. Is it on? Hang on, I don't hear it. You have to hold it really close to your mouth, but it also might not be on. Hold it like you're playing a trumpet. I'm Marla Jemate from Precinct really 7. Really close to your mouth. I'm Marla Jemate from Precinct 7, um, and I am concerned about the number of facilities that we might have in Amherst that were able to sell recreational marijuana if we do have uh, four pending medical facilities, which can then also sell recreationally, plus eight additional recreational facilities. Ah, okay. I guess I'm being told that, that it would just be four more recreational facilities for a total of eight. Um, nonetheless, I, I'm still concerned. I think even eight um, is too many. Um, our primary business here in the town of Amherst is that of the university and colleges. Um, the shared mission of these institutions is the guidance of students. Many of them are young. Uh, they are being guided towards rigorous academic achievement. Um, heavy recreational marijuana use can and sometimes does lead to apathy, impaired memory, diminished cognition. There are studies showing it may also contribute to major mental illness in young users. Um, inhalation of marijuana additionally causes respiratory damage. Um, so allowing several recreational marijuana shops in town 
I, I think runs counter to the welfare business and goals of our unique high aiming community. Um, it has taken UMass decades to lift its prior reputation as a party school. Um, I'm old enough to remember when UMass was known as ZooMass. Um, we can continue to struggle with management of alcohol consumption, uh, periodic heroin overdoses on the campuses, and with issues of consent and periodic sexual assaults on the campuses. The addition of abundant recreational marijuana to this mix could well exacerbate existing core problems. I think we need to carefully guard UMass's hard-won current reputation as an excellent state school with some top programs. Let's also not let Amherst become a destination site for recreational marijuana. We want a thriving downtown with a lively mix of stores, not a major concentration of head shops. Um, I believe that we need to lower the cap that has been proposed. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Kravitz. I did just want to clarify that it would be a maximum, including if the medical converted to, to recreational, so. Thank you. Um, yes, right there, second from the aisle with the red card. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Vickery, Precinct 2. It was a good question about how other communities have responded, and we don't know, but we can't tell how Amherst would deal with four, let alone eight. So we can run a real life experiment with four and see how that goes. We can't tell tonight. Nothing's as hard to predict as the future, as the saying goes. So why don't we try four, and then if it goes really, really well, move it up to eight. Um, yes, the green card there, third row from the back. Jacqueline Maidana, Precinct 5. Um, to answer the question about how other communities in, let's say, Colorado handles it, um, my grandson was stationed in Colorado and he went to a fair and with his wife and three-year-old son. And he said that the, there was so much marijuana smoke that they had to leave the fair because they had their three-year-old child with them. And uh, he was rather taken back by that. So I, I'm, I'm conflicted. I, so I don't know how I'm going to vote on this. So anyway, that's Colorado. Okay. Um, just, just to clarify the red, green, and white cards, green indicates you were in favor of the motion on the floor, and you weren't really speaking in favor of it. So let's try and be careful and think deep before you put up your cards so you're holding the right one. I hear a point of order in the front row. Stand up, wait for a microphone, please. Identify yourself. William Kazin, Precinct 3, if we don't pass this, I'm just wondering what happens. Um, uh, hang on, hang on. I'm first trying to decide if it's a point of order. Um, and sure it is, and I'll let Ms. Brewer try and answer it. Ms. Brewer. What happens is there's no limit. It's up to the free market and the zoning. Although, technically, since there's also a limit in the zoning bylaw, well, there. Ms. Brewer. So, as I indicated, there's norm normally you don't put numbers in the town bylaw or the zoning bylaw, it, but the zoning that you provide obviously limits where things can be. You can't put Walmart where my house is, so that's okay. Um, the planning board, if this doesn't pass, we did not discuss that possibility. We discussed if the number was different and they would adopt that number into the one sentence they have about the number. If, I, it's my belief, well, I'm not gonna guess what the planning board would do. I have an assumption. Mr. Kravitz, can you speak to, if we don't pass a limit, is there a limit? Can you speak to that, please? My understanding is if this article 
fails, the, the planning board in their motion would move to strike that line so there would be no limit in either the general or the zoning bylaws. Thank you. Um, I'm only gonna call on people if they're holding up a card. Um, yes, third row right there. And the other thing, when you hold up your card, this is a kind of funny thing, but if you hold it like this, I can't tell what color it is. So, but yes, third row right there. Thank you, Andrew Parker, Inga, Precinct 5. Um, I'm just gonna start. The reason why they chose more than four is four, there are medical marijuana facilities in here and they will automatically be able to be recreational. If we limit it to four, then that would allow no other free market enterprise to actually open a business here. And it would basically give precedent to the people that have already applied for licenses. So that didn't seem fair to them and that wasn't um, said earlier. Um, I'm not in favor of limiting them at all um, in terms of the amount. We don't know how many we're gonna need. Why would we put a set number on them before we actually know? Um, and if we're gonna see the planning board, you're gonna see there's a very finite number of places that they could actually exist, which um, is gonna fit within somewhere within the eight to 10 to 11. So I'm, I don't see a reason to actually put a limit on those unless it's required by the State Board of Health. Thank you. Um, and now right in the center there with the green card. Meg Gage, Precinct 1. Um, I'm in favor of this. I really appreciate the thoughtfulness that went into this proposal and the balance, the number of things that people balanced. It seems that some people are speaking against it because they're against marijuana or they're worried about the dangers. And the fact is that this passed. This is legal. And so we have to manage it or we won't have any control over it at all. A lot of people don't like alcohol. Um, but we still have to manage it, even if we don't want there to be any alcohol. Some people may not want there to be any alcohol anywhere ever, uh, but that's not gonna happen here, and so we have to manage it. And I just appreciate the thoughtfulness that went into this by the many different people who participated. Yes, um, second row right here in the corner. I move to amend um, the I'm sorry. Shevin, Precinct 7. I move to amend the article to no more than six recreational Mariana retail <laughs> facilities. Motion has been made and seconded to change from no more than eight to no more than six. Um, you may now speak to your motion. We need a microphone there still. Um, amend the article to more no more than replace the word eight and the number eight with the word and number six. Actually, point of order, would, would, would we be voting on the eight first and then the six? You know. No, we will not. We will vote on whether or not to accept the, I'll explain that. You speak to why you want to do that okay. and I'll explain the voting right. part. It's clear to me that we're all conflicted as to what, what we want and it, it feels as though we need to start with fewer and then see how things work and move on. And I would agree that it's unfair uh, to give a, a monopoly to those who have already posted for medical. So let's try with just two more, but not four more. Yeah. And actually, we will handle it the way you suggested. We're gonna discuss the pros and cons of six versus eight. We can also still be discussing the pros and cons of any limit. We will then come to a vote with the number eight, and if that passes, we're done. And if that fails, we will then vote with the number six. If that passes, we're done with that. If that fails, then we have no limits. That's the way it currently stands. One card only, please. Are you speaking against it? Yes, back row, go ahead. Helen Precinct 1. Um, I'm just wondering, as far as the communities around us, uh, Holyoke and Northampton, have they limited the number of establishments? I'd really appreciate an answer on that. And uh, secondly, um, my opinion is let the free market rule. Mr. Kravitz, any comment on other communities? 
I'm not aware of any communities that have set a limitation other than complete bans in, in communities that don't want recreational establishments at all. Thank you. We're now both discussing the main article and also the pros and cons of eight versus six, but hopefully soon we're going to come to a vote. Um, yes, Finance Committee over there. Uh, Tim Neal, Finance Committee, Precinct 8. Apologize for the hat, but the light is right in my eyes. Uh, I have a question on this. How easily would it be to go to eight if we find six is okay, and then how easy it is it to go to 10? What are the steps for moving up? Mr. Kravitz. So just like we're doing tonight, my understanding is we would need to amend the general bylaw and then the zoning bylaw as well. So we would need to take two votes on two different Warren articles to move it from six to eight, and then we would need to do it again to move it from eight to 10. And similarly, if we added an eight and we wanted to go down to six, same thing, we'd have to do it in both the general and, and zoning bylaws. Um. I see a red card over there, and trust me, there's lots of hands, and I do see you all, but I can't always call on you right away, so red card way over there. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jim Brissett, Precinct 6. Um, so it, it just kind of baffles me why we are thinking of placing any limits on this. Um, Colorado and Washington have really had no serious issues with this. Um, I regularly visit relatives in Fort Collins, which is 150,000 population, a big university, and they don't have any problem um, to even get into one of the, rec the recreation stores. You have to show a valid ID. It's not like kids can just wander in and out. Um, also, if you just look at health statistics, you know, if we're so concerned about children's health and other people's health, we should just not allow candy to be sold in, the, in our stores. Um, that has a, you know, when you look at real statistics, diabetes and um, obesity, you know, marijuana has nothing to do with those. Um, the same thing with alcohol. The number of drunk driving deaths due to, mer due to alcohol is just unbelievable compared to marijuana. So I think there's a lot of, my impression is there's a lot of fear out here for a drug that you know, has some proven health benefits. Um, the, and I think it's, it's gonna be already be well regulated. It's not like anybody is gonna be able to set up a little mom and pop shop wherever. Um, there's a, a pretty high cost to set up an establishment um, the other thing I think we're forgetting about is there's a potential if we have, you know, uh, a reasonable number of facilities that we can buy from is that then there also, that also creates opportunities for our local farmers who will hopefully be able to supply the stores. And also just, um, you know, once we limit numbers, um, price price just goes up, that's just supply and demand. And if we're concerned about um, you know, equity, if, if the price is so high, we're gonna, then we're gonna still have a, a pretty significant black market, and that is gonna you know, potentially lead to more injustice as well. So I, I really think we don't have much to fear because of all the regulations in place, and we should really see what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, right there in the center, white card. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Tao, Precinct 10. I had a question. I mean, this may relate to medical marijuana, but um, I moved here from Los Angeles, and when they opened medical marijuana dispensaries there, there was no limit it was just like a loophole in the, you know, how it, in the ordinance was passed. And so dispensaries were opening up 
you know, all over the city. And so the city council had to fix that. So I just had a question that I think that there are cities that have tried to limit the number of dispensaries. And if you don't, they, they will pop up every place. And I, um, I don't see, I mean, there is, we do, don't we regulate liquor stores? I mean, there aren't an, I, I don't know, but that's another question I would have. Does this town have a limit or anything on how many liquor stores can be in a given area? Mr. Kravitz? So I think the previous question was about uh, regional communities that have limited it that I'm not aware of. I think you're right that in other states there, there are limitations. Um, as Ms. Brewer mentioned, alcohol licenses are limited by a state formula um, based on population. There is no formula given for recreational marijuana. So. We don't, we don't locally control what the quota is for alcohol licenses, as the state does. Okay, I'm hoping we're getting close to a vote here. Um, yeah, right there on the aisle. Hi, Lisa Berry, Precinct 2. I'm wondering when we take the vote if we can do the, is it possible to do the motion for six first and then eight? Yeah, so no, no it's not. The rules of town meeting say when you have multiple numbers or quantities, you do the highest first and then the lower one. That was a good question. Um, further discussion? Yes, right there in the aisle. Adrian Terizzi, uh, Precinct 7. I have two questions. One is uh, related to the zoning bylaw, the, the use category that would be established. I wonder if we can get a little bit more information regarding the number of parcels that would come within um, the, that bylaw that would have a use for recreational marijuana? That's my first question, if they have that information. Uh, the second one is um, some help with understanding why we used the 11 uh, alcohol licenses rather than going and saying using the off-premise licenses. One gave, the use of 11 gave Eight is the limit, and my understanding is off-premise would have given about three. So is there any rationale that would help me, either with the zoning and or uh, why not the use of off-premise licenses? Ms. Brewer. So I realize that the, this is very directly connected to the zoning article, but the zoning article is the zoning article, and we'll be talking about parcels and how closely we can identify them in the zoning article. I'm very sorry if I misspoke associated with the details that I provided with alcohol licenses. We didn't choose a number. We are told what number we are allowed to use as our limit. We're allowed to use 20% of off-premise licenses that have been issued, whether they are all alcohol off-premise licenses or wine and malt off-premise licenses, meaning all the package stores you typically think of, wouldn't want any of them to feel slighted if I didn't mention all eight of them. And the three wine and malt off-premises, Atkins, Cushman, Amherst Center Store. That's the 11 we have to work with because that's how many we've issued. We actually are entitled to have issued five more of those wine and malt licenses and we have not actually issued those. Had we issued those, we would be looking at a different number. Um, yes, right here, fourth row in the aisle. Okay, Moran, Precinct 4, I call the previous question. Second. Motion of the previous question has been made and seconded. We will now come to immediate vote, and the first vote will be on the larger number of eight. If that passes, then we've disposed of this article. If that fails, we will then come to immediate vote on the six. If that passes, we've disposed. If that fails, then we've also disposed of the article, but with no limit. So that's where we're at now. This is a, I hear a point of order. Amy Middleman, Precinct 5. Don't we have to vote on call the question? You bet. The first, I was about to say <laughs> that what we're going to be voting on first is the motion for the previous question. Um, and that requires two-thirds. So if two-thirds of you vote yes, 
we will then have the series of potential votes following that. In either case, if the motion for the previous question passes with two-thirds, we will have whatever votes we need to finally dispose of this article. Motion previous question requires two-thirds. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. No. Moderator hears two-thirds. We now come to a vote on the motion with the limitation of eight. So it was the main motion that was brought before us when we began discussion of this article. This requires a majority vote. Again, if it passes, we're done. If it fails, we will then vote on the number six. So we're voting on the limitation of eight at this point in time. All those in favor of the motion before you, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. No. Moderator is in doubt. We'll have an electronic vote. Hang on. Before we start, I hear a point of order. Correct, it's just a majority vote. So as soon as the window's up there, everybody should see a readout on their device proving that it's on. Anybody who just see a blank screen? Good. They're working over there. Our window is open. You may now vote. <laughs> Voting window is closed. You may show us the results. Yes, 98, no, 57, abstain, 7. Um, The motion with the limit of 8 has passed. 98, 57. Can I see your motion now? Concerns uh, 3B1. And essentially, oops, sorry, 3B1. Hang on a second. Which Which article number are you on here? Okay, Article 5 is the next article. What the? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, but but in terms of. So when we switch from 5 to 6, they'll be changing their seating. Come up to me then, okay? Okay, great. Okay. I now call on Ms. Brewer to make a motion under Article 5. Eight minutes. I move, in terms of the article, except, so you got to pull out the warrant, and they're going to put it up there, too. This time, we're going to be clear on this. To delete the following sentence in its entirety. The sentence in question is, whoever is found in violation of this bylaw shall, when requested by an official authorized to enforce this bylaw, state their true name and address to such an official. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. Thank you. The select board recommended Article 5 by a vote of 5-0 on October 23rd and to remove that offensive sentence on tonight. So that was 4-0 because Mr. Steinberg was absent. Public consumption of a legal product is a quality of life issue, similar to public smoking of tobacco products, open containers of alcohol. Even if you're not personally offended by public consumption of these legal substances, that doesn't mean that we as a community necessarily feel comfortable having people walk up and down the sidewalks of Amherst with open containers of alcohol, as opposed to 
some other places people might do that. Or congregate in front of businesses with open containers of alcohol, or smoke tobacco next to our 10-year-old baseball players at Mill River, or bring beer to their parties at Mill River. Public consumption of recreational marijuana is in fact already illegal per state law and has a $100 fine. This article was developed to be more specific about what is meant by public consumption and how it may be enforced with a $300 fine. For those of you who have been in town meeting a while, you know that we have a bylaw on open containers of alcohol. It's actually relatively short. It says no person shall consume any alcoholic beverages, nor possess or transport any open can, bottle, or open container containing any alcohol beverage, alcoholic beverage outdoors on any town street, sidewalk, way, and public property, including but not limited to parking lots, parks, school playgrounds, recreation areas, or conservation areas. And that is a $300 fine. We've had that on the books in some variation or another since 1986. The Board of Health, who you will also be hearing from tonight, regulates smoking in workplaces and in public places, and theirs is a lot longer. They'll talk about that. Is medical marijuana exempt? Yes. I know it doesn't say it here, but it is. Per current state law, although we're empowered to increase the fine as a local action and the methods of collecting it, we are not in any way empowered to remove the medical use clause from state law. In state law, under 94G, section 13, it talks about restrictions on public consumption of marijuana. That's the existing $100 fine place. What it says there is no person shall consume marijuana in a public place or smoke marijuana where smoking tobacco is prohibited. It's a $100 fine, and it clearly says, this subsection shall not apply to a person who consumes marijuana or marijuana products in a designated area of a marijuana establishment located in a city or town that has voted to allow consumption on the premises where sold and shall not be construed to limit the medical use of marijuana. It's unfortunate they combined all that all into one sentence because we are not yet at the place where we are bringing to town meeting or to the voters the idea of allowing consumption on the premises, like you can consume alcohol at a restaurant. We are not yet talking about that. But that is where they stuck in the part about not be construed to limit the medical use of marijuana. If you have questions about the methods of enforcement, and I know we put a bunch of MGL references there, I know Chief Livingstone is planning to be with us this evening. If you don't pass this Article 5, then the state law's restrictions with the lower fine remains in effect. So basically, we just tried to look at the same things. We have prohibition on open containers and public smoking of tobacco and put it together with what we are calling recreational marijuana. Thank you. Finance Committee has no position on this. I now call on Steve George for a statement from the Board of Health. Microphone is on its way. Steve George, Precinct 4, member of the Board of Health, and I'll speak for the Board. Um, the Board of Health reviewed the warrant articles related to recreational marijuana, as we're calling it. We appreciated the interactions we've had with those involved in drafting the articles on public consumption and <clears throat> on uh, zoning. And given the inevitability of commercial sales to recreational users in Amherst, we support the thoughtful regulation of zoning and public consumption uh, as in Article 5 and 6, and as uh, um, Ms. Brewer just uh, uh, persuasively spoke about Article 5. I would just like to add that uh, the board does have concerns about the potential for increased abuse and health issues associated with marijuana products particularly when re retail stores go into operation, presumably next summer. We can't adequately address most of these concerns until we know how cannabis products will be regulated at the state level, as um, <clears throat> uh, Ms. Kruger uh, discussed before. When state regulations are in place, the Board of Health may wish to develop local regulations uh, of, mar re of recreational marijuana from a public health and safety point of view, uh, similar to our treatment of alcohol and tobacco. But we do support Articles 5 and 6. Thank you. This will require a majority vote. The motion is before you, and we are now open to discussion. Um, yes, right in the front row.
Carol Gray, Precinct 7. I move that we change the, the 300 to 100. So in other words, substitute one for three, 300. Okay. 100. Motion was made and seconded. Before you go on, I just want to say, I was remiss when an earlier motion came along changing the number from eight to six, because we do have a requirement if it's not a procedural motion that we get that motion in writing. That was relatively simple, and I didn't realize it until afterwards. And I'm going to give you a pass on this one as well. From this point forward, anything other than a procedural motion, I want four copies in advance of what that motion is. I don't want to be surprised on the floor. So the motion before us is to reduce the amount from 300 to 100. So again, when we finally get to a vote, we will first vote on the $300 amount. And if that fails, we will vote on the $100 amount. Sorry for the interruption. You may speak to your motion. I used to be a public defender. And $300 is a very large amount of money to people who um, are poor. And I could see people thinking that marijuana is legal and thinking they can go hike on a trail and smoke marijuana and not knowing that we in town meeting have passed a bylaw that prohibits that. I could see people accidentally breaking the law. I would propose $100, but I would suggest that the plan, that whatever board deals with this come back in a later uh, town meeting to propose graduated penalties. You could start with a $100 fine. The second offense would be 200. The third would be 300. I just, for people who are wealthy, 300 will be nothing. For people who are college students or low income, 300 is a huge amount for something that they may not have realized was illegal. Um, I see a red card in the back corner there. Uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, I'd like to make a procedural motion to refer Article 5 uh, back to the select board. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. You may speak to your motion, and then I'll explain what's going on. Okay. And is the clock going to be changed? Yeah, he gets five minutes to speak okay. to a procedural motion. Okay. So I'd like to open by talking about the modern era prohibition that started under the administration of President Nixon. Um, and, and we now know why uh, the so-called war on drugs was initiated. Um, it was initiated to do two things. Um, it was initiated to harass uh, those who the, uh, that administration believed were its opponents, students, people of color. The, the second part of the effort was that the Southern strategy of that administration, in fact, uh, related to the, the likelihood that if you had a war on drugs and people were convicted of possession, use, distribution, in many of the Southern states and some Northern states, those individuals would be deprived of the right to vote, access to what used to be called food stamps, access to public housing, and federal employment. This was a conscious, deliberate political strategy, and the town of Amherst should not participate in the modern version of that strategy, the continuation of the strategy, by enacting this bylaw. I agree with the previous speaker who, who spoke about the, the penalties involved. But there are other problems with this bylaw. It, one, as is clear from the statement of the select board member who presented the article, there is a state law. That state law prohibits public consumption. And, and I don't smoke. I, don't, I encourage people not to smoke. Um, if they need to use marijuana for some medical reason, find a method other than smoking. My father smoked two and a half packs. He died at 60. Um, it, is not, it is not good to smoke. It's one of the 
worst things you can do for your health. So if you want to use marijuana for medical reasons or otherwise, find another method. This, um, this bylaw is defective in terms of uh, what it proposes to do by saying that no person shall ingest. Think about that. The people who are going to enforce this are police officers, and I can't imagine what test is going to be used. I can understand the test for smoking. Um, most people have been around marijuana enough, a few times even in their life, to know what that marijuana smoke smells like. Um, are our police officers trained to determine whether the uh, oatmeal cookie or the brownie or some other product that you are um, eating on the downtown street or on a bench is, uh, is, uh, contains marijuana? I don't think so. And I think that the bylaw that addresses the ingestion of this product uh, is defective and needs to be reworked and shouldn't be reworked on the floor of town meeting, which is why I did not make a motion to remove that particular word. <laughs> the fact is, we, we were told at the beginning of the town meeting under Article 1 that there was a dog park test um, uh, task force composed of nine members, only three of whom were, were town staff people. The folks who drew this up with very good intentions were all town staff people and select board members. Um, we need a task force to deal with public consumption. That includes people like the um, Cannabis Reform Commission, uh, Coalition from UMass. Um, retailers or people who are in, engaged in producing these products and residents of multifamily housing. And let me say, as a resident of multifamily housing, um, I don't want my neighbors to smoke in their apartments because there is always a danger of fire. I don't smoke. The person who lives with me does not smoke. And so we need to think through what we're doing with this bylaw to ensure that people who, who live in multifamily housing can use the product that is legal in, in a, an appropriate manner, but not smoke it in their homes. And, and in some places, smoking, in some multi-family units, smoking is prohibited. So I think this needs to be reworked. I would urge you to vote to refer it to the select board and ask them to create a real task force that, that is broader than town officials and come back with something that is more appropriate. Thank you. So the motion before us now is a motion to refer to the select board. That's going to be what we're discussing now. Um, it requires a majority vote to pass. If that passes, then we've disposed of Article 5, and it's something the select board is going to deal with and work on. If that fails, we are back to the motion on the floor that has the two different numbers, the $300 number and the $100 number. So we should try and limit our discussion now to the pros and cons of the motion to refer to the select board. Point of order, Point of order yes. Identify yourself, please. Uh, I'm Frank Getty, Precinct 8. And uh, I don't know if I missed it, but I don't know what the state provision would be if we voted down this and the state provision would be what okay. would be enforced. It's, it's not a point of order. If you get recognized, you can ask that question, but that's a question of substance to the article. It's not a point of order. Point of order has to do with proceedings and what the vote is going to be and things like that. Um, Ms. Brewer. So the select board obviously knows nothing about this motion, so we couldn't possibly have taken a position on it because we didn't even guess it was going to happen. But what I would like to know in order to us to even think about that, is the word we previously I read out, what it says in the state law now is, no person shall consume marijuana in a public place or smoke marijuana where smoking tobacco is prohibited. I was wondering if Chief Livingstone could explain to us what the difference in enforcement is of the default state law versus the particulars that we put in this bylaw. Be interesting. Um, Chief Livingstone, if you'd like to come forward and explain things, that would be great. Uh, 
And if you're curious, I'm allowing this because the motion on the floor is the motion to refer, but the question of the issue is what does it mean to refer as opposed to enact our own bylaw? And that's what we're discussing here. You may Scott Livingstone, Police Chief. So if I'm to understand the question, um, what is the difference between the state law as it currently stands and what the difference would be if the bylaw were to pass? Well, yeah. Part of it is the state law says currently shall con no person shall consume marijuana in a public place versus our bylaw, which is crafted to say inhale, ingest, or otherwise use or consume marijuana. So we're wondering if there's a difference in how you would enforce that, the default versus what we wrote. Chief Livingston, just to remind both of you, um, you have to raise your hand and be recognized by me. We don't have conversations between people on the floor of town meeting. Chief Livingstone. I'm not quite sure how we would really enforce the um, ingestion of the edibles part of it. Um, I can assure you that we're not going to be stopping people walking down the center of North Pleasant Street and saying, hey, what's in the brownie? Um, <laughs> The smoking part would be easier uh, if officers were to see that and, and need to take action. I see a lot of it potentially being complaint driven. Um, quite frankly, I don't know if we've ever issued any cit citations for the, for the state law. I can tell you the d biggest difference, the way the state law is written currently and the uh, enforcement of the bylaws is the actual, the bylaws hold more weight if it goes before a cl clerk magistrate. There's no punitive action for anybody if they were to be issued a citation under the state law. There's no punitive action if they just ignore the citation. So you could get a ticket at, with the state regulation, do nothing with it, and nothing happens. There's more enforcement behind the time, town bylaw enforcement perspective on that. Thank you. Um, yes, second row right there with the green card. Hi, <clears throat> James Steinberg, Precinct 1. I agree with this motion to refer the article back just because I think it should say smoke. Um, given what Chief Livingstone said, um, that they don't know how they're going to enforce it, I, I just don't think it should say ingest. I mean, I appreciate the work you've done and everything, but if it says consume and ingest, it's really smoking that we're concerned about. Thank you. Um, as, um, Ms. Kruger. Um, if, I could, if I could just share a little of the thinking of um, the article on consumption. So I think there's a lot of instances that wouldn't um, trigger an enforcement, but there was a lot of concern we heard in the community and in our own discussion about um, underage people being affected. And I can, I can imagine in a, a public gathering something that was somewhat egregious and not having any way to say, hey, you know, that is really not, that consumption is really not okay. You're in a family-oriented uh, event. So it, it's a tool, and it, it may not come to bear a lot. Of course, I can't guarantee how it will be enforced. But it was partly a sensitivity to... Um, wanting to protect uh, uh, children and youth in what public consumption might look like in a broad sense. Chief Livingstone. You know, I would just add that similar to the open container bylaw, there are an awful, awful, the majority of them, the, the uh, interactions that we have with those individuals are, are warnings. People are given the opportunity to pour it out, discard it, and get rid of it. The individuals who are usually written citations and or charged are the ones who are really just uh, not willing to comply with an officer's request to do something with that, and that's kind of how I see this uh, being enforced. Mr. Kravitz. Just to the, the previous comment, smoking is already prohibited under Board of Health regulations. It's broad enough to include smoking of marijuana, so that's already prohibited by, by Board of Health. Thank you. Um, yes, at the back of the aisle there. Leo Maley, Precinct 5. I'm going to vote in favor of the motion to refer this back to the select board uh, for two reasons. One, just to reinforce what was said by a previous speaker, uh, $300 
is a heck of a lot of money. There are uh, several studies that have come out within the last year that have been re reported that look at the ability of people to, to basically access funds. And I don't have any of them in front of me, but the gist of it, those, were that about half of American families would have, tr would have difficulty with a $500 or $1,000 unanticipated expense, even given one month to come up with that money. Uh, that's the country we live in. Uh, and that's not the country I want to live in. So I'm very hesitant to support a $300 fine, uh, particularly when we already have a $100 fine in state law. Uh, we can work there to uh, reduce fines, and they've headed, the legislature is heading in that direction in some cases with the, with the current uh, uh, efforts to reform uh, the, the criminal code. Uh, the other thing is that I recall back, uh, it may have been 15 years ago now, we passed something here in town meeting, I believe it was in town meeting, it could have been on the ballot, uh, to deprioritize enforcement. Uh, by the police in Amherst of laws relating to marijuana. So even the, the laws that already existed at that time, this far preceded, uh, you know, the, the, the couple of things that have been passed on the state level since then. We had something passed here that said we did not want these things to generally be enforced. Uh, so before proposing something that basically codifies uh, you know, a kind of disciplinarian approach, a uh, punitive approach, uh, I would like to revisit it in the context of what we had done in the past. Um, yeah, right here in the front row. Uh, Richard Morris, Precinct 7. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to, to, to do the Solomonic thing tonight, which is um, I, do, I am not worried about uh, the Amherst police. I do want to take somewhat of a disciplinarian approach, but I do like the uh, option offered by Ms. Gray. I think we should vote no on the motion to refer, and then we should vote no on the higher amount and vote for the $100 because that's a reasonable amount of money. I don't think $300 is a fair amount of money for this particular kind of infraction. So I would ask town meeting to let's get this done with tonight. Let's, let's vote on the, on, the, um, on the actual article, but the lower amount. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, back row there. Pat Church, Precinct 5. I uh, appreciate the decision to suggest it's um, referred to the select board. But I also feel like, why is this here? We were just told that it's illegal to smoke anything. So why do we need another law that tells us it's illegal to especially smoke marijuana in public. It seems redundant, it seems picky, and I agree with everybody who said that the $300 is ridiculous. So please vote it down. Um, yes, right in the corner there with the green card. Uh, Alan Root, Precinct 5. Uh, first of all, uh, I fully am in favor of what is proposed by uh, Town Meeting Member O'Connor uh, for the reason that the overall composition of the first paragraph in this proposed bylaw is so complicated, it's a it's a trading post for lawyers. It, it, it's, it's ridiculous. It should be much more easy to understand, much more compact. Uh, and I also feel very, very strongly uh, in the $100 amount, not the 300 Thank you. Okay. 
Yes, right in the front row there, third from the end. Uh, Laura Quilter, Precinct 9, as one of the 70-something percent who voted in favor of legalizing marijuana, um, I would like to say that one of the reasons that I and many of the others did was because of the disproportionate enforcement and the, and the discretion that was given to police officers. And while I respect the, um, the good intentions of our current um, police force, that is not the law. And so what I would like to do is to not have unnecessary law that grants additional discretion to police, to police marijuana brownies that are being consumed on the streets. So I'd like to stick with the Board of Health rec um, regulation and uh, support the motion to refer for further study. Ready to come to a vote soon. Um, yeah, I see a hand in the back there. Hellenberg Precinct 1. Um, I wonder if this is not a very, very clear case of discrimination. If you're not lucky enough to inherit, as someone said in a meeting um, about affordable housing, a, uh, a house and a substantial portfolio to pay the taxes on it, and you have to live or rent an apartment where usually no smoking is allowed. Now, there are regulations against candles and little heaters and everything else, but you can do whatever you want when you're in a, um, your own house, separate housing. Um, so I think this is an MCAD kind of um, territory, and I would caution the town against uh, creating a law that discriminates against the poor, like this one does. Um. Yes, on the aisle there with a green card. Perhaps because I just raised um, two young men, I looked at this. Oh, I'm um, sorry, identify yourself. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Janet McGowan, Precinct 8. When I saw that list of, no, you can't inhale, ingest, or otherwise consume marijuana, and starting to list every possible public place, I was thinking about like very clear instructions to UMass students about what they can and can't do and where. And so I don't... I don't, you know, and I'm also been a lawyer, so it didn't seem super detailed to me. It seemed super clear, and I think that was the intent of the select board to make it very clear to our many, many young people that, you know, this is something you do in private and not out in public at Mill River or on the, the, um, you know, at the at the pool or in the bathroom to the pool, and just like super clear, cutting down every possible excuse, like, oh, I didn't realize. So I think that was the intent. Or that's just the way I'm seeing it based on my most recent experiences. Thank you. Um, second row in the center there. Gordon Freed, Precinct 6. I rose, raised the red card against the move to refer. But um, when you go into a store and you look at the prices for tobacco, a pack of cigarettes, I think is somewhere around $12. Maybe it's $10. So $300 of cigarettes um, is one month's worth of cigarettes. I'm not sure how much a month's worth of marijuana is going to be. I know that some people consume it several times a day. Some people consume it every single day. I don't think that $300 is probably less than they might spend on a month's worth of marijuana. So if they don't have it, I would guess that they're not going to be spending it on uh, marijuana for that month. They could give it to the town as a fine. Um, so I would vote in favor of the original uh, article as presented. Um, yes, second row from the back there. Ken Thar, Precinct 1. I'll do something I've never done. I think town meeting, I'll move the previous question. <laughs> Motion has, is there a second? Yes. Motion from the previous question has been made and seconded. So the next thing we're going to do is come to an immediate vote, and if two-thirds of you vote yes, we will then next vote 
on the motion to refer, which requires a majority. If that passes, we've disposed of this article. If that fails, we would next vote on the motion with the $300 fine, also a majority. If that passes, we've disposed of the article. If that fails, we vote on the motion with the $100 fine. If that passes, we're done. If that fails, we're also done because we've run out of options. <laughs> Hopefully that makes sense, but if you're confused about what we're voting for at any given time, you can make a point of order, but right now we're voting on whether to end debate. I see a point of order over there. Wait for the microphone. Identify yourself, please. Rob Gustner, Precinct 3. Uh, the point of order was you, you said what would happen after the vote on the motion, which the previous question was called. I thought we went back to the debate on the original, original motion rather than to the other items wow. after, a, after a motion for it. The previous yeah. question is the motion to refer. It's not the other motion. Yes, I suppose if the motion to refer fails, if the motion to refer fails, we would be back to being the original motion and maybe someone would make another motion for the previous question. Who knows? <laughs> okay, motion for the previous question is what we're voting on now. If two thirds of you vote yes, we end debate and vote on the motion to refer. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. no. Previous question has passed. We now vote on the motion to refer. Can we get that up on the screen? There it is, it's the second one. From the bottom, move to refer the article to the select board. This, is a require, this requires a majority to pass. All those in favor of the motion to refer Article 5 to the select board, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. No. Moderators in doubt, so we will have an electronic vote. Okay, the motion's before you, you can vote. Here come the results. Yes, 86, no, 99. So the motion to refer to the select board has failed. So the main motion is on the floor with the two different numbers. Is there further discussion or are we ready to come to a vote? I see no hands. So we are now voting on the larger amount. We're voting on Article 5 as it was originally moved on the floor with a $300 fine. This requires a majority vote. Everybody with me? Everyone understand what we're voting on? Okay. All those in favor of the motion before you with the $300 fine, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. No. Uh, moderator does not hear a majority. So we now move on to the $100 fine with Article 5. This again requires a majority vote. Um, I see a hand, but I don't know what you mean. Is this a point of order, or do you have? We're, we're coming to a, we're, we've ended the debate, and we're coming to a vote. So if it's not a point of order, who? Don't do it because you feel you want to. Do it if you, do it if you have a procedural question, please. So yes. I just wanted to clarify what a yes, uh, what a no vote would mean. A no vote, my would, understanding, would mean means that, that there is no general bylaw. Right, that it goes away. Yes. Exactly. A no vote here means there's no general bylaw. There's still a state law. A yes vote means there's a general bylaw added with a $100 fine. That was a good point of order. That's OK. <laughs> All those in favor for the motion before you with the $100 fine, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. No. Moderators in doubt, we'll have an electronic vote on this one. Pardon me? I can't hear. Could we, hang on, don't start the vote yet, please. We have a device that's maybe not working in the back row there.
Let me get it. Let me get her swap down. Okay. Um, Sean, what's happening? Are we ready to vote? Okay. Well, let's wait till she gets it. Okay, we are ready. And the vote is before you. Window is closed, and this passes 117 to 73. The Article 5 has passed with a $100 fine. We will now have the planning board replace the finance committee at the front table. Thank you. Please take your seats, everybody. Um, quick public service announcement while you're taking your seats. The Amher School Parent and Guardian Association is collecting winter coats and other outerwear for students pre-K through 12. If you have anything you'd like to donate, please bring it to town meeting on Wednesday. There will be a collection box. Thank you. OK, we are now ready to begin Article 6, right? 6. And I call on Mr. Bert Whistle to make the motion. Um, microphone, microphone. Is it on? Yeah. There you um, go. I move in terms of the article, except to delete condition number 3E1D in its entirety, and to limit the number of recreational marijuana retailers to eight. Motion's been made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. I'm actually, I'm sorry, Mr. Stutzman is going to be speaking, yes. So yep. you may proceed. You have five minutes. Just waiting for my presentation to show up on the screen, please. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Town Meeting. Article 6 relates to how the zoning bylaw regulates recreational and medical marijuana. As moved, it would reiterate the limit on the number of marijuana licenses, eight, allowed in Amherst as approved under Article 4. It would also clarify where recreational marijuana would fit into our zoning bylaw. Right now, absent a category specifically for recreational marijuana uses, our building commissioner would have to make a determination about how to classify a proposed recreational marijuana use. This could conceivably be treated as a medical marijuana use and have those same medical standards apply, but there are some problems with this approach. First, many of the provisions governing the medical category just don't make sense for recreational uses. Secondly, trying to shoehorn recreational uses into the current medical category may open the town up to legal challenges, as the state is going to be regulating these two categories differently. To be applicable today, our zoning should accurately reflect the current state regulations as they have evolved since the medical marijuana zoning was passed in Amherst in 2013. In terms of zoning bylaw mechanics, the planning board's approach has been to create a new recreational marijuana retailer use category and adapt the existing medical marijuana zoning language to encompass both recreational and medical marijuana uses. Specifically, Article 6 would insert references to recreational marijuana retailers, or RMRs, where appropriate. It would remove references to medical when just marijuana is sufficient. It would generalize references to state laws and regulations. It would eliminate extraneous or outdated language. 
and it would add a definition of recreational marijuana retailer. In terms of regulating where marijuana uses can be located, the article as written makes only one minor change. Medical marijuana sales are currently permitted in the office park zone. Article 6 would not permit recreational sales in this zone, as no other retail uses are allowed there, and the planning board did not find it appropriate. The motion under the article does make a change which impacts where marijuana uses can be located. By deleting a prohibition, it would allow marijuana retail uses in mixed-use buildings. Currently, a medical marijuana use could be located adjacent to, but not within, such a building. And given that the potential locations for these uses are already very limited, and that uses such as alcohol and tobacco sales are not restricted in this way, the planning board recommends that marijuana sales be permitted in these locations. The planning board voted seven to zero, with two members abstaining, to recommend the town meeting adopt this article. Thank you. I call on Ms. Kruger for the select board. Yes, on October 23rd, the select board voted to support this article as moved tonight um, with the deletion of section 3E1D. The vote was three in favor and two against. Thank you. Finance committee has no position. Um, this will require a two-thirds vote since this is a change, actually in addition, to the zoning bylaw. Um, I'm now calling on Mr. Malley, who would like to make an amendment to the motion. Leo Malley, Precinct 5. I move to change the language in section number 3B, number 1. That's the section, if you're reading along, that says locational or physical requirements, locational and physical requirements. so that that paragraph would read, all aspects of an MMTC or OMMD or RMR relative to the acquisition, cultivation, possession, processing, sales, distribution, dispensing, or administration of marijuana, products containing marijuana, I'm sorry, or products containing marijuana must be taken at a fixed location within a fully enclosed building. So motion essentially made, this is... Motion's been made and seconded to speak yeah. So essentially this is just removing some text from this particular very long sentence. Actually, if you could, before you speak to it, let's try and get the text on the screen and I'm gonna, unfortunately, yeah. I'm gonna go down there and help them get it on the screen. Okay.
Okay, sorry for the delay. You may speak to your motion. Okay, so that's right. That's correct what you see up there on the screen. So basically all I'm suggesting are three changes for, for very specific reasons. And I just want to say in general, I'm glad that you know, there's this effort to get out in front on this and have a bylaw. We need something like this, a lot of good stuff in there, et cetera. This is the only thing that I have issue with. So the first thing is the issue of related supplies, okay? We don't, we have a limit on the number of package stores, you know, uh, places where you can purchase alcohol for off-site use. We have just limited the number of places that we can now purchase marijuana at, assuming they get built. But we don't limit supplies to go along with our wine or our beer. You can buy stemware wherever, one, wherever anyone wishes to, to buy stemware. Okay? You can buy mugs. You can buy all sorts of things to consume one's alcohol with. So I'm just simply suggesting here that whatever the instruments are that you might use to consume your now perfectly legal marijuana should not be limited in this way. Uh, we already have businesses in the downtown that arguably are selling products that could be used to consume your marijuana. Uh, they already exist. They're, they're wonderful, uh, I assume. Uh, they're still there, uh, so they're selling something. Uh, so that's that issue. Uh, why treat these products different than we would any product around alcohol? Secondly is the question of educational materials. Okay. And this is tied into the third point, which is that it should not be visible from the exterior of the building. What that, what that essentially says is that if you have a window, you cannot display a book in your window. You cannot display any kind of advertising in your window. Now, if you think about uh, the, the local uh, package stores, they certainly advertise in their windows. They have their products in the windows. They have all sorts of signs, you know, uh, uh, a 16 pack or whatever, whatever it is, is cheaper this week or whatever. All that stuff is in their windows. We have no problem, evidently, as a town, as a society, with that being in the windows. Why would we have issue with the exact same kinds of things in the windows of the, these sorts of establishments. I don't like it. It's about freedom of speech. We have regulations about fonts and so on and size of signs and all that. You can limit speech in those ways. But why would you limit what could be viewed through a window? And particularly when it comes to literature. So if we move from, I think it's Russell's package store up there, right, right near Town Hall, and you move up a couple of stores, you get the bookstore, Amherst Books. And they have all sorts of books in their window. And uh, Kate, you know, books about politics and whatever, and books about cooking and what have you. So imagine Amherst Books has a, has a section of books about policy issues related to marijuana. They have cookbooks up there about cooking with marijuana. All of those things could not be they could be at the bookstore, but they couldn't be displayed in the same kind of a window display at the business that's actually selling the marijuana. That's, uh, I, I've got issues with that. So I, I would wish to limit it in just, just these very discreet ways so that people can see, see reading material, they can, they can look through a window and, and know what's there, or, or they can look at the titles of books and so on, and so that we treat marijuana, we call it paraphernalia, the same way we would treat wine paraphernalia. Thank you. So just to explain, the next vote we take at this point in time will be whether or not to accept this amendment. That would be a majority vote. If we accept it, we're then back to the main motion as amended, which requires two-thirds. If the amendment acceptance, acceptance of the amendment fails, we're still back to the main motion, requires two-thirds. So let's try and discuss as much as possible focus on the amendment and deal with that first, then focus, focus on the main motion. So yes from the planning board. Rob Crowner, um, the planning board obviously hasn't discussed this, um, but uh, an informal poll right now suggests that, it, that it's not a, a real problem. I, we don't mind if you adopt this amendment. 
there further discussion, or can we vote on the amendment? I see no hands, so we're going to vote, a majority vote, on whether or not to accept this amendment to the main motion. All those in favor of accepting this amendment, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. No. The ayes have it. We now have the main motion as amended on the floor, open to discussion. When we finally come to a vote, it will be a two-thirds vote since this is a zoning bylaw. Is there discussion before we come to a vote? I see a hand there, second, third row from the back. Uh, Chris Riddle, Precinct 2, a question to the planning board. Um, uh, uh, marijuana retailers are allowed in mixed-use buildings. I am presuming that means that they are, I'm thinking of the mixed-use buildings that I know right, know and love right now, the, the Kendrick Place and the um, Boltwood. Um, I'm presuming that that means those retailers could be on the ground floor of those buildings and not up amongst the apartments. Can, I, can you confirm that? Yes, Mr. Stutzman. Uh, if I could, the previous speaker said that they are allowed. They are not currently allowed in mixed-use buildings, but the article as moved would allow them in mixed-use buildings, and it doesn't speak to what part of the mixed-use building it could occur in, so yes. Your, your question was, could they occur on the second floor? If the question was, could they occur on the second or third floor or any floor of a mixed-use building, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, way in the corner back there. Um, Morian Adams, Precinct uh, 10. This is really a follow-up question of the previous speaker. Uh, under prohibitions, it says the proposed uses shall not be located within 300 feet of a building um, containing residential units. And my understanding is that mixed-use buildings do require, do have residential units. So I, I simply don't understand the contradiction uh, between the text and the planning board spokesman's response to the earlier questioner. Um, yes, Mr. Stutzman. Uh, so the previous speaker is asking about a prohibition on medical, or now both marijuana uses, occurring within 300 feet of a building containing a residence, and that is correct, but there's an exception carved out for mixed-use buildings, so a marijuana use can occur within 300 feet of a mixed-use building in the current and in the proposed bylaw. Um, yes, back corner there. Is this, is this from you, Mr. O'Connor? Yep. Why don't you come up here and show me what it is first so I can decide what in the world it is. Basically, so where are we? We are on the bottom of page five where it says prohibition. Uh, if you look on... I have different page numbers than you. There. Okay, you don't. Okay, so I have one on, on the warrant that I have. It's page five. Okay. Um, one E. I see, and one E. You have prohibitions, and then you have, you have one, and then you have A, and so forth. Okay, so you want to... And then I want to go all the way and create...
So, yes, Mr. Um, never mind, he's not raising his hand. We're open to discussion unless we want to vote. Um, yes, back corner there with the red card now. So, uh, Vince O'Connor, Precinct 1. Um, so, first I want to correct the statement by the planning board. Um, you may be right according to zoning bylaw, if that's all that governs anything in the town. But in point of fact, the, the, um, a retail establishment above the first floor of a mixed-use building, which was constructed so only the first floor is, uh, is uh, constructed in such a way as to allow retail use, is not allowed. Um, this is a building code issue, not a zoning issue, and I understand Mr. that. Mr. O'Connor, I'd yep. ask you to address me and look at me okay. when you talk. You're not admonishing the planning board. You're talking to me about the rules, okay. okay? My point is that statement is incorrect. Nothing is allowed on the floor that was not constructed for a retail purpose and nothing above the first floor on any of those five-story um, mixed-use buildings was constructed for retail use. And the building commissioner, I think, will correct you on that. And that's why I think I'm, I'm distressed by, by those five-story buildings in part. The, the point I was trying to make by my amendment, and I'm urging people to, um, to really consider whether to adopt this right now. One is this is a fantastically complicated um, bylaw. And I'm glad that um, a previous speaker got an amendment that would, um, would reduce some of the problems. But my, my, my view... Excuse me, Mr. O'Connor, I hear a point of order. We haven't heard a motion to amend yet. Yes. He, um, I'm not making one. He's not making one. It was a little confusing, but um, there is no motion to amend on the floor. Yeah. What about this, I move to add the following as section 1E that's showing on the window. Oh, I'm sorry, get rid of that, because um, he, um, he was considering an amendment, but I ruled it out of scope. Okay. So, this is my problem as a Precinct 1 town meeting member. One of the few dairy farms in Amherst ha um, has a parcel that's zoned um, uh, light industrial. Um, one of the medical marijuana establishments that um, has been applied for is in, a, a, in that same general area across 116 on Meadow Street where there are no residential users or dairy farms nearby. But this particular um, uh, allowing the light industrial district to be used inadvertently would allow a retail marijuana establishment right next to a dairy farm where people have to get up at four and five in the morning and go to bed early. And quite frankly, it's just not an appropriate location. The planning director has showed me that there are parts of the parcel that's adjacent to the dairy farm that could be used. I think it is unfortunate that the planning board has not found a way to, uh, to keep a retail establishment of this sort um, from being located right adjacent to a dairy farm um, where the people who work at that farm um, have, uh, are not, do not need a retail establishment uh, that is open even to normal business hours. So I think, unfortunately, the planning board has, has just looked at maps and not thought about the people who live next to these red parcels. And I would urge people to defeat this bylaw. Thank you. Um, all the way in the back there with a the white card. I Mark Power, Precinct 1. Could you please put up the maps that show that North Amherst area, please? Because that area was zoned flood-prone conservancy by town meeting virtually unanimously in 2002, I believe. I remember I was here then. I'm back. <laughs> And um, the, the idea of putting up a retail building in the middle of hundreds of acres of APR farmland that Amherst paid tens upon tens upon tens of thousands of dollars for and then defended the flood-prone conservancy to the state Supreme Judicial Court with a three-zip unanimous verdict, we won. 
And now we see that someone's trying to put a retail marijuana store next to specifically the last dairy farm in Amherst. And it, the idea is absurd that there would, that there would be a retail store in that area. And first of all, the map, this is not the map I'm talking about, the one that shows the, uh, that's the parcel, but you have a map that shows about 40% of that parcel down next to J&J &J Farms as being available for retail in this space. Well, over 15 acres of this 20.5 acres is zoned flood prone conservancy, and that thing shows about seven acres in one end. And some of the flood prone conservancy is in, the, is in the north end, and there's some area up there. My point is that the map is wholly inadequate in terms of its accuracy. And the idea, again, this whole area is all Amherst farms. Anybody who drives down 116 and looks to the west and sees all that irrigation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's the farmland. It's not the map. We all have it, but that's not it. It's the one that shows the purple at the old auction barn, which is grandfathered in as retail because it was a business all those generations. But the rest of that isn't. There's no other retail in there. It's housing and farms and flood-prone conservancy. Could you get the map up so people could see what I'm talking about? Um, no? yes. I think he's talking about the map that showed the yeah, um, medical marijuana facilities. From, um, Mr. Stutzman, meanwhile. The overhead. Yeah, could you, no, could you move it up a little so people can see what's going on? Okay. okay. You see the triangular parcel right below the purple rectangle? Okay. You see that about 40%, maybe even more of that, down in the bottom, the orange, is now going to be zoned retail? That's, that's, well, why? I mean, okay. it's, it's absurd. Your time's up, and I think we got the point. So um, let's find Mr. out. Mr. Stutzman first, and then Ms. Brestrup after. Mr. Stutzman. So I was just going to say that um, the medical marijuana establishments are already allowed on that parcel. There's no uh, map changes that we're proposing at this point. What is being shown is what already can happen. Excuse me. If you want to be recognized again, you're going to have to raise your hand. We don't have a discussion back and forth. Um, I'm going to call Ms. Brestrup first. She had her hand raised for a while. I wanted to say that um, there was a map up here earlier that showed a purple area, if the IT department would put it back up again. Um, and it showed the purple area, that map there, the purple area is zoned uh, limited industrial, along with the other purple area to the north and to the east. Those are very small portions of this property. The rest of the property, as uh, one of the town meeting members said, is um, in the flood plain. Flood plain, flood prone conservancy. So what shows up as yellow here normally shows up as green on our zoning maps. Um, so uh, this map shows that there is a possibility that someone could um, establish a marijuana establishment in those red boxes that are to the east side of the purple area. I think it's highly unlikely that someone would do that, but those areas are 300 feet away from the farmhouse. So I just wanted to show you that that is the case. Someone could do that, but it's unlikely. And there is already a um, medical marijuana establishment slightly to the north on the other side of Meadow Street that is currently under construction. Um, yeah, right there, white card. Irene Hodner, Precinct 3. I have a question. So you have before you have the map about the North Amherst locations, and this relates to the question about prohibitions. And here it says, or any other facility in which children commonly congregate? Um, I think that's um, 3E again. And then in the map of North Amherst, uh, one of the red squares is where Pineapple Dance is currently. So is that a place that where children commonly congregate? Also is across the street from the survival center. So how are these places limited? Mr. Stutzman. 
So I think the important thing to keep in mind with both this example, the previous speaker asked, and the speaker prior to that's question, are that the maps we're showing are potentially where these uses could occur, but they can't take into account every consideration such as was pointed by the previous speaker or the one prior to that about a residential use which may occur or a place where children congregate that may occur because those circumstances are subject to change. And so that would be something that would be assessed at the time of an application for one of these uses. But the maps do show the actual parcels on which they occur, not taking into account some considerations like that. Thank you. Always looking for new hands. Um, second row right there. Laura Quilter, Precinct 9. I believe that the select board said that the vote um, was 3 to 2. And um, if I'm correct, I, I would like to hear uh, somebody from the two sides speak. That would, thank you. Uh, Ms. Kruger. Um, I would be one of the two. Um, I should have said, I, I kind of omitted this, uh, I was in my notes, but the reason that we had that split vote was um, merely our difference of opinion over the deletion of the prohibition um, around mixed use buildings. So we had um, different opinions about whether retail marijuana establishments should be allowed in mixed use buildings or not. Everything else was fine and um, that was, I was in the minority, but um, the rest, the majority of the board felt that it was okay to allow in mixed use buildings. So that was the difference in our vote. Further discussion? Yes, I see a green card right in the front here. Carol Gray, Precinct 7. Um, I'm going to move to delete one section. And here's the section. That's great. Next time you have a motion, I'd ask you to hold up a white card and not a green card. Green card implied that you were going to speak in favor of the motion on the floor. OK? And we don't have, you know, try and follow the protocol. I thought you could make a motion on a green. OK. Um, so I'm moving to delete section 3A2, which limits the hours of operation prohibiting any business between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. And the reason is simply, if it's legal, then we shouldn't treat it differently than, for example, alcohol sales. And I understand there's blue laws, but I just, I don't really see why we would treat this differently. Um, and the, the, uh, the zoning, excuse me, the special permitting body can decide what's an appropriate time of closure, but, um, as far as I know, there's no limitation saying that liquor can't be sold after 8 p.m. Maybe I actually don't buy liquor or marijuana, so I don't really know, but I'm, I'm guessing that there's no such prohibition, and I think that uh, we shouldn't treat this differently. We should treat it the same as alcohol. It's, uh, alcohol is actually much more lethal to the highways and things like that. Um, anyway. So, and, and if this doesn't pass, I think this is a complicated bylaw and there seems to be numerous um, issues with it and I plan to vote no um, if this doesn't pass. So again, I ask people to hold up a card that's accurate to what they're going to be speaking. It's really unfair to me, it's unfair to the meeting. Um, the motion on the floor is to delete under the regulations, which is section three, um, the A.2, the second use regulation. This is what we're discussing now, and the next vote will be on this amendment, which requires a majority. We'll either delete it or not delete it, and then we'll be back to the main motion, and we'll come to a vote really soon. Yes, from the planning board. I'd like the planning board to speak to it next. I have a point of order, actually. So okay. isn't this expanding the scope of the article? So right now, the article is limiting sales to 12 hours a day. And really what this proposed amendment is doing is opening it up 24 hours a day. Isn't yes, so, so if you have, currently we have nothing. And you're proposing a limit, and this is 
lessening the limit so it is in scope. It's between the limit and nothing, so it is in scope. Yes, Mr. Stutzman. If I could just clarify a statement you made, Mr. Moderator. We do currently have these regulations on the books for medical establishments. Um, I'm sorry, say that again? So we do currently have the hour limitations as written for medical establishments. Okay, just a clarification there. Um, Ms. Brestrup, did you have something else? Yes. No, that was the same thing. Okay. So um, discussion on this motion to amend. And yes, on the aisle right there with the white card. Lisa Berry, Precinct 2. I just want to point out that um, I keep hearing this, well, we want to make it in sync with the alcohol laws. And I think that um, raising two children here, I'm, I'm kind of worried about alcohol. I don't think that we want to st strive to necessarily... This is a, an opportunity, I think, to rein in before we know what's going to happen with marijuana. And we don't have that opportunity with alcohol. Things are already on the books. And I wish that we could rein in alcohol, but we can't at this point um, without a bigger... But this is a huge opportunity where we are right now. So I'd say let's seize this, keep it limited, and then if things aren't problematic, I would advocate for increasing, um, but, but not until we know more than we do right now. Thank you. Further discussion? Um, yeah, I see a red card back there. And the motion on the floor is the motion to amend. So I presume your red card applies to you being against the motion to amend. That is correct. Good. OK, you may identify yourself and speak in that case. There you go. That is correct. I don't think we should be expanding the hours of retail stores for that. Okay. Mark Power Precinct 1. Thanks. There we go. Thank you. Further discussion? Are we ready to vote? Um, yes, in the back there. Hello, Precinct 1. Um, I just want to speak to um, the uh, thoughts expressed by the previous speaker to the last. Uh, in fact, places where marijuana has been legalized, the sale of alcohol, tobacco, and pharmaceuticals has plummeted. Further discussion? Um, yes, I see a white card there, third row from the back. Yes, right there. Um, it helps if you stand up when you're recognized and that the microphone can find you that way. Chris Riddle, Precinct 2, I moved the previous question. Um, is there a second? second. Motion of the previous question has been made and second. We are now going to come to an immediate vote. If two-thirds of you vote yes, we will then vote on this amendment, which requires a majority. We're going to vote on whether or not to accept the amendment. Once that happens, the main motion is back on the floor, either amended or not. So this next vote is two-thirds to end debate and vote on the amendment. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. Motion passes. We are now voting on the amendment, which, let me find it in my, okay, to delete section 3.a.2 in its entirety, which is the hours of operation portion of use. This requires a majority. All those in favor of the amendment that removes the second use regulation, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. This has failed. We are back to the motion on the floor. I'm sorry. I, you want an electronic vote on the, mo on the vote to amend? Okay. Let's have an electronic vote. And it's open before you. This is the Article 6 amendment to remove the second use regulation. And we have yes 27, no 118, abstain 9. That motion failed. Is there further discussion? Are we ready to come to a vote on the main zoning article? 
I see a card right there in the front. Uh, Tim Neal, question four. I would like some clarity regarding the, the uh, ability to have a retail establishment on above the first floor of a mixed-use building. I just don't have clarity on that based on some previous speakers. So if someone could answer that question. Um, yes, from the planning board. So I th uh, Steve Schreiber from the planning board. So I think Mr. Riddles, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, a question from a town meeting member earlier about whether or not I, uh, one of these marijuana facilities could be on an upper floor was a theoretical question. And the theoretical answer was yes, they could be. And they could not, but they really could not be in the current buildings that are currently built for all kinds of fire code reasons, as has been pointed out earlier, that really what you're doing is you're introducing a different use into the midst of a residential area, which would require all kinds of fire separations. Those buildings are wood frame above the podium. And so there would be all kinds of complications. So the reality is the existing buildings, mixed use buildings that are under construction or have been completed recently, this will not happen on anything other than a lower floor. But theoretically, the answer is correct that it could be on a floor other than the, the ground floor. Um, it's Brestra. When mixed use buildings are approved, they're approved by the planning board and the planning board sees floor plans for all of the floors and the planning board decides whether um, a floor is going to be residential or whether it's gonna be commercial and retail. In the cases that we have to date, the ground floor is commercial and retail, but it's conceivable that the ground floor and the second floor could be commercial and retail and the floors above could be residential. So that's one thing. The other thing to keep in mind is that any of these uses, medical or recreational marijuana, require a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. So they're considered a second principal use. So they actually require going through the whole application process with the Zoning Board of Appeals um, in addition to the process that the mixed use building has gone through with the planning board. So they're considered separately. Just wanted you to keep that in mind. Thank you. Um, yes. Third row right there on the aisle. Jeff Blaustein, Precinct 6. I recall the previous question. Second. Do I hear a second? I do. Motion for the previous question has been made and seconded. If two-thirds of you vote yes, we will end debate and we will come to an immediate vote on Article 6. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. No. Motion for the previous question has passed. We now come to a vote on Article 6. It includes the amendment that you see before you, Mr. Malley's amendment, which was already accepted. This requires two-thirds vote for passage. All those in favor of the motion under Article 6, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. No. Moderator, here's two-thirds. No. We'll have an electronic vote. Window is open, you may vote. Yes, one oh four, no fifty. Um, the Article 6 has passed. 104 to 50. Um, I call on Mr. Slaughter to make a motion. <clears throat> I move to adjourn to Wednesday, November 8th at 7 p.m. Motion adjourned has been made and seconded. This is not debatable. All those in favor of adjourning until Wednesday night at 7, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. We are adjourned. <laughs>